Hello, and welcome to Peak Cube, the one and only Pokemon Cube podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Martin, brought to you with co host Connor Lavelle. Connor, welcome to episode two. How are you? Doing great. How about you? Doing good, doing good. Hey, we got a lot of good reception from the last episode, and we appreciate that. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to bringing you guys more content going forward. For uh, this uh, first segment, or introduction, Connor actually had a really cool idea, and you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, this is by community suggestion. We are going to rip off a bit that a magic uh, podcast called Limited Resources does. And at the beginning of at least this episode and potentially every episode in the future, we are going to do a -a crack-a-pack. So whatever cube we are talking about in that episode, we, uh, of course, will link it in the description of everywhere that we post this. But um, we are going to open a pack and we are going to talk about what we would pick out of that first pack if it was our first pack and first pick of the draft. So it's going to be interesting. You'll get some uh, potentially very nitty-gritty in-depth analysis of exactly why we might pick one card over another. So if you're really trying to level up your cube game, then it could be a great opportunity for you to hear some thought processes from other people. Uh, so like, kind of on that note, I guess before we like, jump into it, like, do you have any like general like guidelines for like your first pack picks just to kind of like inform the listener? So the the first things that you're going to be looking out for are going to be cards that you can play in anything, and they'll be very powerful. Um, and I say both of those things, and they're they're both very important. So if you get a card that you can play in everything, say a Professor Birch, which is uh, the same as I guess a Bianca or a Lily, um, it's it's not amazing. It's not terrible. Right. Um, you're not going to be necessarily super sad to pick it. Although pick one, you hope you get something better than that. <laughs> um, but if if Professor Birch is up against like a very powerful stage two, even though you can't play that stage two in every deck, you're probably better off taking that stage two because it's going to be a lot stronger for you. But uh, that that goes around to my point of if it is powerful and it will end up in every one of your decks almost certainly, then that's going to be the thing that you look out first for, look out for first and foremost. So uh, it's going to be things like Computer Search, Professor Juniper, and uh, any of those super powerful consistency pieces that are going to really help your deck run well. Right, and especially like in the first pick of the pack, like that's when you have the most options available. So you definitely want to be like mindful of what cards you're picking, especially like if you're, you know, thinking about taking a line or thinking about taking like a certain card. You want to make sure it's going to end up in your deck. You don't just want to randomly want to take like a, and maybe like a random basic or something that's not actually going to matter later on. I mean, you could, and maybe it'll matter, but I think you you maximize the most potential by like picking the quote unquote best card. You know, definitely. Yeah, let's just jump into it. So um, Connor's going to read the, the pack itself. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it on the display. Um, so what do we got here? All right. So this is a pack from my cube. Uh, it is a mid-power cube centered. I would say if it was centered around anything, it'd be about fourth generation. But there are cards from, from way back, and there are cards from pretty recently as well. So it's more of an unlimited cube. Um, but uh, just... Hopping right into it, we have a Cursed Stone a Stadium from the third gen era. Deals damage between turns to every Pokemon that has a Poke Power. We have a Jirachi EX from Plasma Blast with Stellar Guidance. We have a Haunter from Fossil. We have a Voltorb from Stormfront. We have Eco Arm, I believe that's from Ancient Origins. Uh, we have a Poochiena from a Ruby Sapphire set that I don't recognize the symbol of. It has Surprise and Sharp Fang. Uh, we have a Strong Energy, very powerful card. We have a Golduck Break from Breakpoint. We have a Riolu from Platinum. We have Morty, the Supporter. We have Lapras from Legend Maker. We have a Shiny Voltorb from Stormfront. And we have a Victini EX from Plasma Storm. So we picked this pack. Uh, we generated a few, and we picked this pack because we thought that it was really interesting. So, uh, Andrew, do you want to go into a couple of the cards that we kind of picked out right away, or that you picked out right away from this pack? Yeah, and like this pack's kind of interesting because um, there's a few like I think eye-catching picks. Like obviously the Lapras is something that I think a lot of players would gravitate towards, but there's a few other considerations you could look at and make justifications for. Um, I'll start with Lapras. I mean, Lapras, if anyone's familiar with, like, Tepu Lele GX, um, but essentially Drought GX is also in this pack. Um, letting you search out, basically, a supporter from your deck, benching it, is really strong. 
Um, especially in pretty much in any deck, you're gonna use this consistency to help you draw through in your game and execute your strategy. So you can reasonably expect Lapras to work its way into most decks, and um, assuming like you know it's gonna fall in your strategy. One other card that's uh, particularly interesting is Strong Energy, and I'm sure anyone who's played in the past three years probably is familiar with that card. It allows Fighting Pipes to have extra like 20 damage when it's attached, which can be really good, especially in the fighting decks that are in this cube. Now, it's not going to be played in like every deck, like you're not going to play it with non-fighting type Pokemon because it wouldn't work, but uh, if that's something you're interested in playing at, and if you know you're going to be playing that going into the draft, uh, that could be a potentially really strong first pick. Um, something else you could consider doing is... Um, you know, taking, not taking the strong energy to let it wheel and see if that line is even open. Uh, I know, Connor, you talked about the potential strategy in that. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. So if, you, uh, if you're undecided in your draft, you're very early on, you know you have lots of options that are going to be available to you. One thing that you can do intentionally is you can let through a very powerful card like strong energy. You can, you can let it go and you can see if it comes back around. And most of the time, a card like strong energy is not going to come back because it's very, very good. Um, it's better than uh, about half of the cards in this pack at least, and uh, very good chance that it doesn't come back to you. However, if it does, then that indicates to you that fighting is, at least for this first pack, totally open. Because anybody that wants to be in fighting, or anybody that took a fighting Pokemon, is definitely going to take this strong energy as soon as they see it. So it essentially shows you that that is an archetype that you can go into that you are almost certainly not going to be fought for, at least not at the beginning. Um, there's a chance that if people get really desperate toward the end, maybe they end up moving into a fighting type, but very, very often this is a telltale sign that you are going to have a really nice and easy draft being on that fighting deck because you already have a super powerful tool and you know that nobody else is on that tool yet. Or on that, on that type yet. Which I think is something that um, is kind of like almost like a next level strat. Like you think about how am I going to draft my deck, but then you also think about like the field itself of other people who are drafting. Like there's it definitely plays on like the like meta game that is like at the table. I think that's something that's really cool that Cube has to offer. It's more than just drafting well. Like there's also like a lot of skill and like you know reading the the field essentially and like what is happening within a pack. So that's a perfect example of something you can do. I know for me personally, uh, I would take the Lapras. I'm curious to see what you would. Like want to take in this pack looking at it i'm I'm torn between three cards um and my my three picks would be lapras from legend maker mm -hmm. we've talked about that one quite a bit just super powerful basic pokemon as soon as you bench it bench it you can search your deck for a supporter you pick it over jirachi ex because you don't give up two prizes if your opponent does knock it out um there is the strong energy which i, I like strong energy a lot because even if you don't end up in fighting the upside of taking strong energy if you do end up in fighting is really high. Your deck is going to be way better with strong energy than without if you do end up in that type. And it could get you onto the type early so that you can take some of those cards early on and make it less likely that people are going to end up fighting for them later. Uh, and then the last card that I'm looking at is Cursed Stone, the stadium. Huh. Um, for people that are not as familiar with earlier eras of Pokemon, it reads, at any time between turns, each player puts one damage counter on his or her Pokemon that has a Poke Power. And uh, a Poke Power is essentially, if you're in a cube that is splitting abilities into powers and bodies, which this cube is, um, a Poke Power is essentially any activated ability as well. So uh, what Curse Stone can do is decks that rely on powers, which there are very, very many powers in this cube, are going to need to get that Curse Stone out of play very fast. And even if they do, it's going to be additional damage for you if you do end up playing a deck that doesn't rely on powers or it can keep them out of play until your opponent counters your Curse Stone. So I, I don't... It, it's not the most versatile card in the pack by any means. Uh, it's another card like Strong Energy where it, it definitely requires a certain kind of deck to be in. But it's a card that I'm going to be looking out for at the very least when I look at this pack again the second time. Yeah, I think that's uh, a that's a really good point too because uh, it also kind of lets you know where other people's heads are at, like especially like if you're at like a six person draft. Um, I mean, there's a higher odds like if no one's taking curse stone by this point, it's not really on their radar. Uh, I guess right. given the context of this pack, 
Uh, I also think, too, it also pays off having, like, maybe studied the cube you're drafting maybe a little bit. If this was, like, a cube league situation where you'd have access to the cube list. Um, knowing that maybe there's only, like, two curse stones in the in the whole cube and this is your chance to get one of two. Uh, could, could be some good knowledge to have beforehand and might influence your decision, too. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why I stray away from it on this first pick, though, even though if somebody did take this curse stone in the first pick, I would understand their reasoning. Um but I don't think I would pick it just because in this cube there are very many powers that people are going to end up using. Most of the decks that you end up in are going to have at least one power that you want to use in a game. And Curse Stone can be a detriment to you if you have it in play when you need to use those cards. So probably probably not, probably the lowest of the three, I would say, for me. Yeah, uh, Below the strong energy in the Lapras. Yeah, it seems like we're both in kind of agreement with the, the strong energy of the Lapras. I, I like what you said about the strong energy. I think there's a, I think there is something to be said about how good, how much better the card is in your deck if it ends up in your deck, and just to have the card, have the option to go into fighting this early could be really strong. Of course, right, like yeah. context is probably your your best indicator on what you should pick. Yeah, and and this in general in cube, um, so the the first thing that you need to think about is how likely is this card to end up in my deck. Um, and, right. and usually that is pretty easy to assess. So like if I take this Legend Maker Lapras, it's definitely going to end up in my deck. Like there is no feasible situation where I don't play this card. Um, but if I take this Strong Energy, I know, okay, I'm only going to play this card if I'm playing at least fairly dominantly fighting. Mm -hmm. However, the Strong Energy is going to make my fighting deck a lot better if it is in that. So the benefit that I gain from the strong energy in a fighting deck would be greater than if I had the Lapras in the fighting deck. Now, is it to such an extent that I would take the strong energy just out of hand? It's not. I would probably take the Lapras out of this pack. But that is something to consider. If you do see a card in your pack that is incredibly, incredibly powerful in a deck or a certain set of decks, and it's strong, and, and the advantage gained is really significant then it might be worth taking over something that's more generally useful that makes sense uh i guess like so something to think about too so like let's just say this is like maybe we got into this pack later maybe like four people touched it before we got and we're left with maybe like a eco arm or victini ex is there any argument for taking either one of those cards when it gets to you so uh, on, on like a fourth to fifth pick, I'm probably looking at like a Victini EX. I'm looking at a Golduck Break, Eco Arm, um, maybe Curse Stone still in the pack. Mm -hmm. Golduck Break is a really versatile break. I think it's underplayed in this cube. Um, you can do a lot of different stuff with it. You can get it get into a lot of different archetypes using it. Um, so that would be something that I might look at if uh, if there were no great versatile cards in the pack. Um, Victini EX is a great basic energy accelerator. Turbo Energize gets two energy out of your deck and attaches them to Pokemon of your choice. So if you can get a fast Victini out, then you can really start getting energy on your board really quickly, which for some decks is going to be a huge advantage. Um, Eco Arm, shuffle three tools back. This cube isn't loaded with tools but there are some very powerful ones so definitely a card to look out for and if you do get that eco arm before you get those tools then you can prioritize those tools as you move through the draft so the odds that this eco arm is going to end up being a really powerful card are pretty high if you take it early um so so those are the cards that i'm expecting um if i'm committed to a psychic archetype morty might be a good consideration mm -hmm. um just a very powerful disruptive supporter but uh, other than that, I do not think that uh, that anything else, the, the evolving basics are nothing to write home about here. Right. Uh, I do think it kind of illustrates the point even further, though, that uh, the thought process for the first pack pick is consistent throughout the rest of the picks, too. So even once it's like the fourth, once you get like the past, like the fourth person in the line, you can still go through the same thought process um, when you're picking your cards. I always think that's probably the hardest thing is uh, I mean, it's a little bit easier once you have, like, good cards to pick from, but, like, when you're picking the best out of, like, a sea of meh, like, having the, uh, the for like, the, like, the ability to evaluate cards like that, I think, is, um, something that improves your drafting game. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, I, I would say it improves your drafting, drafting game dramatically. Right. Um, being able to 
make the decision between the seven out of 10 and the five and a half out of 10. I mean, you know, if you make that decision 10 to 20 times during the draft, because a lot of the cards that go into your deck in the end are going to be in that five, five to seven out of 10 range. Being able to make that distinction between the five and a half or the five and the seven, it's going to make your deck dramatically better in the end. Oh, I, I totally. And I think like being able to understand that too, and like being able to be consistent about it, like um, making sure you're always grabbing the you know, the card you you want to grab, and not like just randomly taking like a evolving basic. I think putting more puts more forethought into your draft, and I think makes the experience too more involved and a lot more exciting. I would think. Definitely. All right. Well, this has been fun. Uh, I think this is something we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to keep doing because I think there's a lot we can uh, dig into <laughs> with these uh, with these. Uh, what do you call it? Crack a pack? Yeah, crack a pack. Yeah, I, I think that they're really interesting. I think there's a lot to be learned, and I think that they're a lot of fun too. Just to kind of, uh, even if you're a listener, you can kind of follow along and you can uh, look at the pack before we say exactly what we're going to pick, and you can see how your picks line up with ours. So I think there's a lot of fun with it as well. Yeah, and if you're uh, watching on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave us a comment. Let us know what card you were going to pick. Uh, we'd love to hear what your guys' thought process are and like. How you guys approach drafting i think uh taking the conversation even further is something we always strive to do so feel free to like jump in let us know what you think absolutely uh so we have a jam-packed episode for you guys today uh we talked all about what cube is in the last episode this episode we're going to talk about how to actually build a cube so from picking your lines to getting the exact cards you need to have a fun balanced cube We'll cover all of that, and then we'll actually dive into like uh, actual well, dissect the cube essentially uh, with the champions cube breakdown coming in the second segment. Basically, going through what the cube we're gonna be using for that, and uh, some cards to watch out for, some lines that are looking pretty strong. We'll give you the whole lowdown. We're gonna take a brief uh, break as we transition to segments, but we'll be right back to talk about how to build a cube. So we'll see you in a second. All right, welcome back. So as I said before, uh, we went through basically what cube is and how to get into the format. And for this segment, we'd like to actually cover how to build a cube. That's kind of like the next progression in the, the cube journey, I guess you would say. Um, so we're just gonna go step by step how to pick your power level, your Pokemon, your trainers, kind of just give you a general guide on how to go through all the steps. Because you think about having 600 cards to pick from, like how do you even make those decisions? Well. I can tell you it's a lot simpler than what it sounds and there's a process to follow and it and once we get into it uh if you're feeling overwhelmed by it well, hopefully you'll have a lot more to go off of at the end of the segment so Connor, why don't you kick us off where do you even start when you're thinking about building a cube sure the the first advice that i always give to new cube builders is look at cubes that have already been built look at existing cubes people have spent so much time, so many hours and hours and hours, and you can save yourself so much of that time by just looking at the work they've already done. Um, you can gain ideas on what Pokemon you might want to include, on some strategies that you might want to include. So say they have like a healing strategy for their grass type line, and you don't, you want to use a different grass type line, but maybe you could use that healing strategy for like a water type line or something like that that has different cards that have similar effects. So take advantage of the resources that are out there um, cube discord legend box those are your two best cube sources right now in the discord uh i know that best pal al and odysseus are compiling a list of essentially every cube that we've run in the group so uh, i think the list is getting <laughs> pretty large at this point so i, I would that imagine is, that is going to be the first place that i would recommend anybody look if you have no knowledge of cube at all look at existing cubes. It's going to be amazingly helpful. Uh, and the other place that I always say first and foremost to people who are going to be trawling and digging through cards is pkmncards.com. That, and we're not sponsored. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're, no. they're just the best. Um, yeah, it's, um, for those that don't know, it's a card, Pokemon card search database. You can basically search for any card on there. Um, I, I spent so many uh, hours on there just like looking at lines. You can basically advance search, find pretty much any, like if you want to search for any like Charizard or whatever Pokemon card on there. It makes it really simple to like find what you need. So it's yeah, great for cube. You can, you can even do some more complex stuff too. You can mm -hmm. do like, I want to look at trainer cards that came out after Heart Gold Soul Silver or like, I want to do, um, 
HP or fire stage ones with less right. than 130 HP. Like you can you can do a lot, and uh, all of them, uh, all the searches show up really nice, large images that you can see, you can read. Helps you uh, get that site recognition a lot more easily. So pkmncards.com, that is definitely the place that you should be looking for your scans if you are just in that building phase. Uh, the other place to talk about is PokemonTCG.io. If you are building your cube in the drafter for like the Cube League, for Cube Discord, or just to play with your friends online, then that is going to have all of your set abbreviations. So if you enter all your stuff into the drafter and some of the imports fail, then you can head on over to that website and you can look at what set abbreviations it's using because that is actually the website that the drafter is pulling its images from. Oh, I actually did not know that. That's really cool. Yeah, a bit, a bit of a cheat there, but it will save yeah. you a lot of uh, headache. So links for those will obviously be in the description if you're watching on YouTube. Um, with that too, just to kind of kick things off, just like general advice that I want people to lean on is just be okay to like make mistakes. And honestly, as we're going through this, build what you think is going to be fun for you. Don't necessarily feel like you have to like fit into a certain mold here. Like everyone has a certain play style. I know we talked about this last episode, but uh, ultimately cube is about like the experience. It's not necessarily about having objectively like the best built cube unless that's what you're looking for. So just keep that in mind. Like we'll offer suggestions on how we would do it. But ultimately, you know, every cube is kind of up to the creator. Would you agree? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, if, if you and your friends are having a good time and everybody's having a good time, like every single time you draft it, but say like one or two of your lines are not great, what, what does it matter? Now, right. you, you can improve on that and then maybe you add a couple of lines into your cube that are even more fun than, uh, than some of the options that you've tried already. And that can be a great aspect of changing your cube over time. But, uh, you know, if you're having fun with it and there's no deck that is just kind of like lurking in the shadows that if somebody gets it, they just win, then um, then you're in a good spot. Like cube is supposed to be fun. So if it is, then you're doing a good job. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that. So that way, you know, as we're going into the segment, like this is just one way to do it. And I think it's, you know, a good place to start if you are starting from the bottom and you want to figure out, you know, you're, you're looking at this now and you're like, how do I even like start this whole uh, cube thing? Like this should hopefully be a good guy, but just understand that, you know, you can build it however you want. Um, but with that said, I mean, like, where do you start when you're thinking about building a cube? Like what's the first thing you, you want to think about? So the first thing that I like to think about is power level. Um, right. And power level is kind of an abstract concept. So, if you don't know what power level you want, so so me, as someone who's been involved in cube for a long time, I'm going to go in and I'm pretty much going to know like, okay, I want to try to build a this power level cube and then I'll start there. But if you don't know what power level you want, totally fine. Just pick some of the Pokemon that you want to use. So find a few lines, find a few Pokemon specifically. You could even just start with a couple of cards and you really want to put them into your cube build your cube's power level around those cards. Use those to balance your cube and build out the rest of your lines. You don't need to have this huge comprehensive idea of exactly what you want to do just to start building. So when you uh, say like power level, um, are you talking about like HP and like attack power or like what goes into that? Yeah, so so going into power level, um, the, the three categories that you're generally going to hear about in the community, I don't know who popularized these. It, it might have just been the community in general. Uh, but the three that you normally see referenced are low power, mid power, and high power. Uh, low power characterized by stage twos dealing roughly 60 damage on an average attack. Uh, your average stage two takes two to three, sometimes even four attacks to knock out. One shots are really rare, difficult to pull off. Uh, they can exist. Stuff like Lugia EX is a really nice one shot Pokemon that fits into low power and mid power too. Uh, but it, you know, very expensive. And this is the Lugia EX from, uh, I believe, Unseen Forces. It lower has, case uh, EX, yeah. <laughs> yes, lowercase EX. It has water, lightning, fire for 200 damage. And then you have to discard a water, a lightning, a fire. So pretty hard to set up, but you you get a lot for it. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking at for low power. Your sweet spot as far as the highest concentration of good cards is going to be Gen 3 and earlier. But 
for all of these power levels, there are going to be cards from every era of Pokemon that are going to fit into your cube. So don't uh, don't let the era govern what you're doing too much unless that's your goal with your cube. Now, um, like era in this respect is like saying like um, like 2003 to like 2006, right? Like like Gen 3 being like the Ruby Sapphire like era, not like Gen 3 Pokemon, right? Right, right, yeah. So uh, you you could have predominantly gen 3 pokemon in your cube just because that's where a lot of the low power pokemon are Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you have to make a gen 3 cube like say a a card came out in the black and white block that has good attack costs and you know fits win fits in well then that's a great inclusion it you don't need to limit yourself to any specific block unless that's your goal right Um, but Uh, moving on oh sorry Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say, so, like, one thing to think about in case, like, people aren't the most familiar with, like, Pokemon history is just, like, when you think about power creep, and I'm sure we're all aware that the Pokemon get bigger and bigger as time goes on. Obviously, if you start from the beginning, Pokemon are going to be a lot weaker, and then if you go it up to now, your Pokemon, Pokemon are generally going to be stronger. Um, so, you can kind of think about, like, low power existing more, more prevalently in, like, the beginning, and then high power existing more prominently in, like, today's sets. So... That's a gen- it's not always the case, but like that's just kind of a uh, guideline I would think would help. Definitely. But anyway, um, so yeah, so like low power is like generally characterized by the games generally last longer, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, it, this is very generally. Uh, I've seen right. pretty long high power games and pretty fast low power games, but high power games generally run pretty fast because, uh, as you'll hear in just a few minutes, one hit knockouts are very common. So um, games move through pretty fast. Uh, So generally, the lower your power level is, the longer games are going to have the potential to go. But um, especially if you have like lowercase EX Pokemon, two prizers, uh, that can accelerate the pace of the game as well. So don't worry too much about that. But if you do have a group of friends that really just want to have a fast cube experience, could go for uh, for one of those higher power levels. Do you think low power is like, one of the more difficult to build just because of the uh like maybe more people are unfamiliar with that era so i would say yes for a couple of reasons low power is the most difficult to build because they're you know the least number of players that are currently playing have have played with mm-hmm. those cards already they don't have experience with them and then also if you have a broken card in low power that card is gonna be absurd because everything around it is so much weaker so see, when yeah. you when you make a mistake, you're going to feel it a lot more. Uh, on the flip side, if you have a card in low power that's too weak, then uh, it's maybe not going to feel as bad as it would in high power, but it's still not going to be able to succeed very well or very reliably against the other stuff in the cube. So, oh, That's a good explanation of it. But let's move on to mid power then. So like that's more like... That's the 60 to 90 damage range. Like, kind of, like, two shots are more common in this era. Kind of, like, Gen 4, maybe some Gen 5, you'd say. Yeah, I would say that's generally the area where you're going to find the highest concentration. Uh, once again, there are going to be lots of options outside of that as well. But mm-hmm. um, you you are going to see more one-hit knockouts in mid-power, although they, they are still not going to be easy to pull off. Uh, things like Infernape Level X become good options in mid-power, Cards that have conditional attack costs, but maybe not as extreme as Lugia. Uh, I would say that mid-power, at least for a while, mid-power was probably the most common power level of cube. But nowadays, with so many new players getting into it, um, high power is getting a lot more representation as well. So hard to say which one is more popular at this point, um, but none is necessarily better than another. Yeah, I mean, again, it all just kind of comes down to like how you enjoy the game and what uh, appeals to you and your taste. Exactly. Whatever you enjoy in the format is exactly what you should be doing. So, like, what's the general, like, HP you'd find in mid-power? Like, are we thinking, like, 120, 130, or even, like, above that? That seems a little bit high, but what do you, so, what do you, what would you say? Generally, in low power, you're going to find, like, 80 to 90 HP on stage ones, and these are all trends for single prize Pokemon. Uh, two prize Pokemon are going to break the mold a lot. Sure. And then you're going to see HP between 100 and 120 on your stage twos uh, a okay. lot of your multi prizers are going to push up into the 140 to 160 range pretty normal um 
And then in mid power, your stage twos are going to be in the 100 to 130, maybe 140 range. Definitely not unheard of. Um, and uh, and your stage one's going to be a little bit bulkier, maybe 90 to 100 HP. You could even go up to 110, 120 if the card is right. Uh, mid power doesn't quite have to be as strict with, with the HP totals as low power tends to be. Um, and then high power, which we will get into shortly here, a lot of the time HP totals are going to go up pretty significantly. So in high power, you're going to see 150-ish as your average stage two. Um, stage ones are frequently going to go as high as 130, even 140 on the particularly bulky ones. So uh, pretty, pretty significant jump from mid to high power. And there are definitely gray areas between them where cubes right. can exist and be built. But those are the numbers you're going to be looking at most of the time. So I think kind of like, and I might, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think kind of some general, like, if you're looking for examples of maybe like the, like the power levels we're talking about, uh, I think like low power can kind of be like, a, the idea can kind of be uh, like, think about like 06 decks, like those kind of like that kind of power level, would you say? Uh, in terms of Pokemon it, being it's, used? It's hard to say because um, some of the combos that were in 2006 decks if they were in a cube would be extremely difficult right. to beat. Um, so so like LBS, Lugia, Blastoise, Steelix, which could reliably deal 200 damage turn after turn, um, even though those cards are all from that 06 era, they are still, like that combo is yeah. still going to be way too good for a low power cube. So uh, it's a little bit tricky to to kind of like say, you know, this is where you should look in the metagame because... Kind of like you... antiquate the, uh, the power level. Yeah, I... Um, I was trying to think about like at least the cards being used are generally like within those like regions. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like mid power, so like, I usually think of like 2010. Yeah, like, I would say 2008 to like 2010 is like usually what I think of like cards being used. Like you have Clay Doll, you have uh like Luxray Level X tends to make its way in there. Gardevoir tends to work its way in there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then like uh, high power cubes, I tend to think of more of like 20, uh, like at least like 2016 to like maybe uh like maybe now like those kind of like more like aggressive cards you could find like higher hp higher um uh damage output obviously like dx's and ex's are kind of not really uh i mean they can they can work their way in there but not usually something you see in like high power unless it's like you know a very specific case um i guess we should talk about high power that's what you're saying is trying to become more common as uh new players start to come into the game which makes sense because it utilizes a lot more of the uh, aggressive styles that we're seeing today like sycamore and like aggressive draw and higher power uh damage output um what kind of pokemon do you usually expect to see in those high power cubes sure yeah so so we talked about the hp levels a little bit uh your stage two is going to be 150 hp or upward that's not necessarily a universal rule but on on average uh stage ones are going to be 120 to 140 hp a lot of the time um your stage twos are going to need to be able to deal 100 plus damage pretty reliably. Uh, if they're only swinging for 100, probably you need to do it for one or two energy. Um, mm -hmm. One hit knockouts going to be extremely common in high power. Um, big basics are also, they become much more reasonable to include because their power level is not so inordinate. And I'm talking not just like the old big basics like Reshiram, Zekrom. Those are probably better off left to high power but i'm talking even some of the more prevalent threats in more recent times so sledgehammer buzzwool um, mm -hmm. touchdown buzzwool <laughs> buzzwool has a lot of fun options for high power cubes um and and another thing about high power is that speed is very very important you need to have high quality trainers because if one person gets off to an extremely fast start and the other person is playing with kind of middling trainers then it's going to be very, very difficult for that second person to win. So a pretty high concentration of powerful, fast cards is going to be important in high power. Yeah, something to think about too is that because the game is a lot more accelerated, there's, um, you think about the number of turns you would have as something like low power where it's taking longer times to knock out Pokemon. You have more time to draw into cards um, and execute strategy. High power, I mean, there's still time to uh, make it like a skillful game, but there's less turns per se uh, that are going to happen because it's such an accelerated rate. So if your deck is filled with suboptimal cards, you're not able to access the cards you need uh, as quickly, uh, it can be a detriment. So that definitely plays into the uh, ne necessity for uh, high power or like high quality trainers like Ultra Ball, 
stick more and that stuff as opposed to like uh you know slower cars that maybe won't yield as much uh as those would definitely um so then i guess the last one's kind of more of like a you don't see this often it's like ultra high power which is more ex ex focused um I I I played a few of them. They're I mean they're definitely and it's more common to like what you, what you expect to see in standard today. Like it's a lot more you know two prize heavy and a lot bigger attacks. Um, how do you have anything to talk about with that? Yeah, so I mean it it essentially just addresses uh the the top end of Pokemon's most powerful cards that wouldn't even fit in high power. Um, you know you you can't put a tag team in most high power cubes. It's just gonna <laughs> just gonna completely roll through it. Uh, but you could design a cube in which some tag teams would be just fine and they would be good in context without being overpowered. Now, some of the most powerful tag teams that are in standard today probably never going to fit into a cube, at least not for the next couple of years when the power level has increased even more. So um, like ADP is probably not going to be able <laughs> to find its way into a healthy cube for at least a couple of years. Uh, or maybe even longer than that, because it's it's you know warped our current standard format as much as it has. But um, that uh, that's kind of what you're thinking about when you think about ultra high power, uh, which is very informal. Like uh, I'd say, that's the least commonly used naming convention, but it's just what we're going to call yeah. it for this podcast. Uh, anything where you are pretty much expecting to use EXs and GXs most or if not all of the time, that's what you're going to be looking at there. Sounds like my, my mutant cube. I have a mutant cube that's just uh, solely EX and GX based. That's a lot, It's just really wacky. It's not really meant to be competitive, but uh, you know, when you can evolve like Buzzwall GX into Lycanroc GX, like that's something that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty strong. <laughs> but like, obviously it's just kind of wacky. It's not really... It's not really something you look towards. I mean, I guess you could. It could be you know, a fun thought exercise to try to balance something like that. But I would generally expect that to be more like, more for the for the for the laugh out louds. I would say, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, more more for like the gimmicks and uh, like, yeah. hey, you know, this would be a fun, fresh thing to do, and uh, and keep your your more serious cube from getting stale. But uh, you could build a serious cube. In fact, we've been testing uh, a cube in the Discord for. A few months now trying to get it really ironed out that does have gx pokemon in it so is that the uh, uh is that the uh gen 7 all-stars yes gen 7 all-stars i drafted cube. that one actually that one was a lot of fun yeah i uh, i've unfortunately been busy every time that we've run it but uh, i look forward to drafting it and i've heard a lot of good things about it i know that every time we play it it gets closer and closer to to being good for a cube league and I have to imagine that we'll probably see it run uh, in, in this upcoming season from uh, February to July. So be on the lookout for that if that's your cup of, cup of tea for sure. Yeah. Um, so then I guess let's move on to that. Like, oh, I guess we have one more thing to talk about block cubes. Yeah. So block cubes, we, we talked earlier about how, you know, low power is going to have a higher concentration of cards in Gen 3, but you're not limited to that. Block cubes, you are limited to that. <laughs> right. That is going to be you know your ruby and sapphire to power keepers cube your diamond and pearl to rcs or diamond and pearl to call of legends cube your black and white block cube these are cubes where you have very deliberately limited your card pool so uh anytime you say okay i'm only going to use the sets from this era or i'm only going to use sets from this period um, generally, if it's a fairly small period of four years or fewer, I would say um, it's it's going to be considered a block cube. Uh, I have seen cubes that are like HS on that are meant to be played on PC PTCGO. Wouldn't really consider that a block cube because that's like half the game <laughs> at this point. Right. So yeah. uh, there there is a limit. Pokemon. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. There, there is a limit to exactly how large of a block you can have. So I would say generally four years or less is going to be that uh, that sweet spot. So is that like so? I guess like, would you be interested in building a block cube if you were just like really passionate about an era, or do you think it's more of like a challenge thing? Because I, I would think it'd be kind of hard to build like a cube and limited to just like you know one specific like block of uh, cards is, instead of having the whole pool to pick from. I think I think the number one reason is you you've got to have a love for the era that you're building it for. Uh, right. You know, it is definitely a challenge, but ultimately you are you are not going to have a great time with it 
if you do not enjoy the decks and the cards that are in that era. <laughs> you know what? Um, I, I will say, I think actually, just thinking about it, I think Wizard of the Coast is probably a good fit for this kind of like style because there's a lot of, uh, like that era itself is very like, um, very, people have a lot of fond memories with like, uh, like, like base, uh, uh, like base Neo. So I could definitely see cubes revolving around those blocks being very effective. Yeah, definitely. And and I think that uh, Wizards of the Coast block cubes are probably some of the most common. Block cubes in themselves are a very small percentage of the cubes that have been built, but uh, Wizards of the Coast era is definitely the most common out of them. I think those are really cool, actually. I like seeing the I like seeing how people built those. Yeah, I, I like looking at them, too. I think they're really neat. I think they're extremely hard to balance um, mm -hmm. just because the Wizards of the Coast era, so few options and... Uh, a lot of the time, the the meta game decks are just so far and away more powerful than uh, the off meta decks that it, it can be very difficult to balance. But uh, it can be done. I believe it can be done. And if you take some of that with it, it is very. I think it is very fun to draft, like especially like the older era cards in general. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Very. So there's definitely experience. a lot of value in it and in itself, even if it's not the most balanced. Yeah, and um, one other thing about block cubes, if you do decide that that's what you want to do singleton is not the way to go for block huh, yeah. cubes singleton being uh one of one copy of any card um block cubes you do not have enough of a card pool to go singleton i've seen a lot of people try singleton block cubes and every single time decks are just not consistent enough they don't do what you need them to do and people who are not setting up very consistently are, are not going to be having a very good time with the game so definitely don't limit yourself to singleton, especially in regards to your trainer line. That is the number one thing about block cubes. If you do want to go in and build one, just keep that in mind. Right. Okay, cool. So just kind of like recap what we're talking about with power levels. So uh, when you're trying to get started, uh, obviously what Connor said first is just kind of pick Pokemon you're interested in or like, you know, where you're kind of leaning. But uh, for baselines, you can think about low power, which is like a lot slower pace, like a lot less damage. Mid power, which is more of like a 60 to 90 range, kind of just obviously as it implies in the middle of where the damage cap is. Then you have probably what most of us are familiar with, your playing standard is like high power, um, you know, a lot faster knockouts, a lot faster paced game, uh, but decks need to be a lot more consistent and a lot more fast paced. And then, you know, if you want to kind of reach out into maybe the... Uh, I don't know, avant-garde maybe for like better word, like some of like the, I don't want to say weird, it's like different stuff. You have the, uh, the ultra high powered cubes, um, which, uh, have, you know, they're, they're, they're in front of experience within themselves. And then you have the block cubes that of course, uh, as the name implies, you can, you know, if you have really passionate about a certain block or maybe you really love Wizard of the Coast era, um, then maybe those would be a good option. Um, so let's jump into Pokemon then. That's kind of like the, the defining trait of a lot of cubes is what Pokemon they use, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, your Pokemon determine your power level. <laughs> so right. uh, at the end of the day, your Pokemon are going to define your cube and they're they're going to be what make the experience fun and unique. And uh, it's what people gonna, it's what people are going to remember. So well, Pokemon... that's kind of what separates this from like a magic cube. You know, it's like instead of like having like, you know, your different like, I guess, colors, for lack of a better word, uh, you have your Pokemon and um, there's different approaches to that. Are we approaching this from more of like a traditional standpoint or like a mutant standpoint or what do you where are you coming from with this? Uh it just kind of depends on mm -hmm. uh on what you want to do. Generally, I'll say we'll probably talk about things in a more traditional stan sense. So non-mutant just because traditional cubes are fairly significantly more popular. There is a very passionate mutant community out there. There are tons of different uh, ways that you can go with your mutant cubes. So uh if you do want to build a mutant cube, don't be discouraged by any means. And we're not right. discouraging mutant cube at all. It's just um, we're we're not as experienced with it, and we're not quite as passionate about it. I would say, uh, so mutant cubes are great, and uh, and if you want to build one, you should. But in general, we're going to be talking about numbers for non mutant cubes. Yeah, which I think is mostly uh, where just a lot of this comes from too. Like mutants are kind of like. Uh, it's kind of its own beast uh, when you're thinking about Pokemon and lines just because your options are a lot more open. Um, so uh, just kind of like compartmentalize that. That's a separate uh, thing that, you know, we can go into maybe in a different episode. But for the sake of uh, understanding how to build a queue, we're going to be talking about more like the traditional lines of, of Pokemon and uh, how you would pick those, uh, which I think is fair. So then we have types, right? There's a bunch of different types to pick from. Do you generally find yourself wanting to accommodate all of them or do you just pick like maybe like 
the triangles that work out like fire grass and water like how do you approach that when building a cube so i'll say first and foremost it depends on the size of your cube if you're trying to make a smaller cube then it's not a bad idea to cut down to you know four or five types um when I say smaller cube, talking like in the 360, 480, even down to 240 range, definitely want to cut down to, if you go down to 240, you might even cut down to like three types. Uh, generally, the fewer types you have in your cube, the m less important you want weakness to be, whether that be, you know, making a rule that weakness isn't a thing or making their, or giving lots of options for weakness prevention, or just making sure every single line in the cube has another line that it's weak to, just make sure you balance that out. But uh, it uh, it's really up to you, even in a larger cube. So my cube is, I believe, 624 cards, and uh, I, I cut a couple of types. Uh, I don't have really any metal Pokemon whatsoever, and then uh, Fairy and Dragon are generally types that you don't really want to include in a cube unless you have a really defined idea for them but dragon types not not quite as bad just because there are a lot of really defined lines for dragons but fairies especially there are just not a lot of options so i think um, i think something to keep in mind too is like especially for dragons and fairies that those types didn't even get really printed until probably like the latter last third of the game's existence so like gen 6 gen 5 i mean gen 5 we got dragons Gen 6 we got fairies so there's not a lot of time for those lines to really develop and of course pokemon acts dragons and fairies right now so that's probably all the fairies and dragons we're going to get but they don't have there's <laughs> are good dragon lines and i think there's probably some good fairy ones out there i haven't checked but they didn't they haven't had the same like lifespan as like grass and fire has um with all the different pokemon they printed so just bear that in mind it might not work it might be harder to build a low power dragon line i uh, mean maybe it's the whole you know but there's not as many options as you would have with like the vast array of other pokemon that's been printed yeah, it, it might be possible, but it would be tough. I, right. I don't know for sure it can be done. Uh, but but yeah, so pick the number of types that works for you. Um, really, the big thing that matters is that one type is not overwhelmingly better than others. So um, I've seen in cubes before where fighting hits like three or four different lines for weakness. And right. then there's only one or two psychic lines in the cube and, and fighting just ends up being the best type to attack with. So um, usually it's not going to be an issue, but, you know, just do a check um, when you kind of have your lines outlined. Just say like, hey, you know, is it going to happen where one line is disproportionately more weak or hits disproportionately more types for weakness than others? So, so you would say looking at weakness is probably an important thing too when you're thinking about types. Yeah, definitely. I think also, um, I mean, like if you look through like different like eras of Pokemon, like weakness changes throughout uh, Pokemon's history. Like some Pokemon are weak to like grass at some point, and then they're weak to water, or like weakness is times two here and plus thirty. So that's some stuff to consider as well. Is like how is that going to balance with the rest of your lines? Like is is all of your uh like like fighting is a perfect example because you can have lightning weak to fighting dark weak to fighting colors weak to fighting and like that can create to a huge upset for like one type has so much more of an advantage just by weakness alone so um but you know not all um i'm gonna say not all dark types are necessarily weak to fighting some are weak to grass so it's something you can look into um there's probably a better example than that but um that is definitely something to consider i would say the most prevalent example that you could very visibly see is uh psychic types because right. ghost oh, and yeah. psychic are lumped into the same type a lot of psychic type pokemon are weak to dark and a lot are weak to psychic so um that's a, a pretty immediate example that you can see of uh of cards having the same type and different weaknesses one other thing is um like andrew talked about with eras so for a long time fighting type pokemon that were like ground or rock in the games were weak to grass and then in the Diamond and Pearl block and Hard Gold Soul Silver block, it switched over to water, and then it switched back. <laughs> so right. uh, things like that happened more often than a lot of people don't realize. So you can, a lot of the time, find a part of your line that is actually weak to something else, and that can be pretty useful. Yeah, so, I mean, like, I feel like weakness is something we don't, like, if you're just playing the game, like, it's not something you put a lot of stock into just because, like, Generally, you can, like, assume that, like, every fire type is weak to water, but it's, sometimes it's not always the case. Like, there's some nuance that happens throughout the game and something you can take advantage of building your cues. I think we've talked a lot about weakness, though. Let's get into, like, the actual, like, lines themselves. 
Um, so like when you're looking at numbers, uh, there's I guess like quite a few routes you're to go for. I tend to lean on the eight basics, six stage ones, four stage twos. Um, but uh, we can talk about a few different options. I know there's uh, like seven, six, five, and six, five, four. Do you dabble with any of those kind of lines, Connor? Um, so, uh, so my cube features lots of, uh, lots of like eight, six, four, one lines and like, uh, for stage ones, six, four, two lines. I like to include a lot of, uh, level X's and that kind of thing, which add an extra stage on top even, but, uh, oh, right. I, I generally yeah. like eight, six, four lines or eight, six, five lines. Those are my favorites just because, uh, you don't want to have too thin of a basic and stage one base for your evolving Pokemon because, if you do end up seeing, let's say you see a couple of stage twos toward the middle of the draft and you realize, okay, this is probably open. I want to get onto this because it's better than what I've got going right now, or I don't have anything going on right now at all. Then having the ability to draft enough basics to actually play the line is going to be really important. If you see a few Greninjas in pack four and you saw two Frokies in pack one, and there are only five Frokies, and there are five Greninjas, well, you're really sad, because at most, you're only ever going to be able to get out three Greninjas at this point, and that's if all of the Frokies that you haven't seen are still left. So making those pyramid lines is really, really helpful for being able to get into a line after you know the first two packs. And kind of and a similar thing, too, if you're going to, whatever number you choose, like if you chose eight six four, make sure you're, you're doing it consistently across the whole line. Um, I level X as it breaks are kind of its own thing, but like you want to make sure if every line has eight basics, like every line has eight basics instead of like you don't want to deviate too much because it, it's confusing for the people who are drafting and like it can it can make things really complicated very quickly. Definitely, yeah. So, um, you you want to keep your lines uniform. Uh, when you have a lot of experience, then you can go in and, you know, <laughs> it's a lot easier to break rules in a fair way once you really have a strong understanding of it. Right. But uh, right when you're starting out, especially, just make all those lines the same thickness. Don't make anything thicker than others because that it's going to make it easier or harder to draft some decks than others. And that's really just not what you're going for. I actually have a, a funny story to share on this. Uh, so when I first built my queue back in like 2018 and we uh, drafted it, um, I, I drafted uh, Metagross out of my queue. And I noticed I only had two Matangs and I was like, it's fine. Uh, you know, I may do what I had. And then I, I came, whenever we finished, I was cleaning up. And the next day I was going through my queue just to kind of like take stock and everything. I noticed I only had two Matangs in the queue. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but I only had two Matangs, which explained why I didn't find them. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I'm, I think I just built it, and I I must have just not have double checked. Or I think actually, I remember taking it to if you remember Charlotte Regionals when we drafted it. Um, I think I might have actually just left the cards at home. Like I might have just forgot to put those in the box. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, and and but, that could be easy to do too. So. Uh, and then and then I think I probably like has put some extra cards on hand to make up the card counts. But I just remember thinking like, wow, I'm glad I drafted the one line that I messed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A, a lesson in practice, uh, not, not a deliberate thing even that you chose to do, no. but <laughs> it definitely shows what can happen when that does happen. At least I hope it wasn't deliberate. I mean, like, <laughs> I don't know. that's one way, that's one way to nerf a line, I suppose. <laughs> Sabotage yourself. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd share that. Cause that's, that's, I'll never forget about that. This is like one of the dumbest things I think I've done in queue is like, oh yeah, I guess I should have more <laughs> stage ones. Absolutely. Um, so in that, so we have um, going through your lines. The other thing that's kind of like, I know this is a huge thing I had to learn was uh, understanding the value in big basics. Uh, big basics can get, they can get crazy really quickly because they have an advantage over like stage one and stage two is that they don't necessarily have to evolve. So, you want to make sure, like, if I was going to play, you know, Baby Buzzwell and something, that whatever is in the field can handle, like, a, a sledgehammer, and not it's not going to take over the game. So, um, Connor, I know you've broken my cubes before with uh, Fighting Fury Belt and uh, Evolve Ball. <laughs> the darkness thing. I remember that completely. Yeah, I think... Mario, I think... where you had a you had a Fighting Fury Belt on a uh, X and Y Evolve Ball, and uh, no one could kill it. And it was killing everything by like turn two or three. 
Yeah, uh, the the first time I played your cube, actually, I it was I had uh, Evil Tall X Y, I had Fighting Fury Belt, I had Muscle Band. Yeah. Um, and I basically just started every game with Evil Tall X Y, and then I had the Tyranitar. I think it's from Ancient Origins that accelerates to itself from the discard and deals 150 damage. And that was pretty much the entire deck. I think I had like a two one two Tyranitar and just the Evil Tall. And uh, a lot of the time, the opponents didn't even get to knock out the Evil Tall before the game was essentially over. So uh, be very careful of your big basics. And I mean, like, I never thought about that. Like, as, especially as someone who started playing in, like, Sun and Moon, like, you were, you're just used to this idea that, like, basic Pokemon are, you know, they're generally, like, the most efficient Pokemon to play. And you think, oh, yeah, so those in the queue would probably be pretty good. But you don't think about the impact, like, that would have against, like, these Stage 2s and Stage 1s. And like how like dominant those can be so early on. I don't know. It's just something that just like I was you. I saw you build it, and I was thinking, oh, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you if you ever want a fun test to see if big basics are too good in your cube, uh, bring it bring it over to testing week for uh, or just any cube weekend in the cube Discord. And uh, if there are basics in the cube that are too powerful, I promise you they will be found. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Give the give that a try if you're not sure. Uh, we always welcome submissions. So, yeah, I think the I think the moral of the story is uh, just be err on the side of caution when you're throwing uh like basics that are meant to just be attacking the whole time. Um, generally, I find it best to just um cut back as much as you can and like really once you drafted your cube more and you feel comfortable with it, maybe then start sliding like stronger basics in there. But I always recommend starting just maybe like the necessary ones like. Cleffa or like Lone Vulpix, like those are good basics because obviously they're not going to be doing a ton of damage. But cards like Ubeltal and Buzzwall can be problematic, and just be mindful of that when you're selecting those cards for your cube. Definitely. So I think we've talked enough about Pokemon as far as like the lines you should use uh, and picking those lines. Uh, let's talk about trainers. That's kind of the other. That's the other side of uh, the cube part, and that's a lot of your consistency. It also, can lead to a lot of problems if you aren't careful. So. Let's, let's talk about the first most important effect in the game, that is Gust, which I'm sure anyone who's played Standard right now is more than familiar with uh, Boss or Eldegoss or Boss or, you know, Boss's orders in general for being good or being familiar <laughs> with Guzma. Like, Gust effects are one of the most important and also one of the uh, almost like turning the tables effects on the game where you, it, can just, it can just blow things away. But, I mean... There's a right way to do it. So what would you say about Gust when you're building a cube? Like, how should you prepare for that? You you just need to understand what effect it's going to have. And you need to understand what advantages the decks that have it are going to have over decks that don't. Um, so a lot of the time, I will see a cube with, like, one or two Gust effects. Say it's, like, mid-power. And then the deck with those gust effects is just so much better than mm -hmm. the deck without. Um, on, on the flip side, you can include a fair few gust effects in your cube. You know, four to eight, even 12 if you want it to be really common. Uh, and, and that can be a perfectly fine angle. And uh, it can allow you to kind of increase the tempo, increase the pace. And, uh, you know, if everybody's got it, then it's a lot less broken than if only one or two people have it. That's what I was thinking, too. I mean, that's kind of the point I wanted to make was if you're going to have Gust in your cube, which there's nothing wrong with having Gust. I have Gust in my cube, and it's it's never really a problem. But what I have found to be the most effective strategy is just make sure everybody has access to it. Um, if you have, like, just, like, one, like, Lysander or Guzma hanging around and someone gets it, they have an immediate advantage. So... An example of like what I do in my cube is that I offer a Lysander at the beginning to everybody and it's treated like a prison star. So use it once, goes to the Lost Zone. And that's like the only version of what I call hard gust in my cube. I don't have Gust of Winter Guzma available in the draft. So with that, it keeps it, you know, fair. Everyone has access to it. Now that's just one way you could do it. I in general want to make sure that you're not like you don't want a situation where somebody has access to all of the gust effects and everybody else doesn't because there is an inherent advantage of that, which we already talked about. So just kind of to wrap this up, is just think about the advantage people are going to get if they were to draw into all of the gust effects or at least a fair amount of them and how that could change the gameplay. Because I'm sure as people know, it's not a lot of fun when someone is just playing down these gust effects and just like dominating the game. Like that's not very interactive, right? 
Right. And and one thing that I will mention, uh, one last thing about gust effects is uh, conditional gust effects are a lot more oh, balanced. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, your, your gust of wind, your Guzma, your Lysander, I, I've said it in the cube group and I stand by it. Guzma is probably the single strongest card ever made in Pokemon. Um, right. And uh, those those effects are the really scary ones. However, your your counter catcher, your pow hand extension, your custom catcher, your double gust, um, these cards are not nearly as broken, and and they're totally fine in cube. And a lot of the time, they're really skillful. So uh, those are much less problematic, and you don't need to be nearly as concerned about them. As yeah, just I like universal. I like to call those like soft gusts. It's like they're not exactly the same thing as like what gust of wind is. Like you're just. It, that that to me is like a lot more fair and balanced. Like counter catcher requires a stipulation, same thing with pow. Um, even like custom catcher requires like two of the same card in hand, and there's definitely like a, a like a line to where like it's too good. And I think like Lysander, Guzma, and Gustavo clearly like demonstrate that. But like I don't mind having um like double gusts, which requires like both players to switch something, or counter catcher which requires you to be behind on prizes like those things don't feel as broken but they're still good like they're not bad cards in cube they're really good but there's a place right right definitely a place um and this kind of brings us into like the next thing when we're talking about power level uh it's base set cards like wizard of the coast era your uh professor oaks your energy removals your uh cube gas depending how you word it um how do you feel about those cards in in the cube so I really just think that there are three that you okay. need to be particularly concerned about over the others, and, and the others are mostly fine. Um, and those three are Energy Removal, Super Energy Removal, and Gust of Wind. So we've already talked about Gust of Wind and why that's so powerful, uh, but Energy Removal and Super Energy Removal just completely change the course of a game instantly. Uh, for, for a trainer, basically no cost and and the game is just completely defined in a lot of cases by those cards so uh definitely mm -hmm. something to keep an eye on uh one way that i've seen people start to adjust is i've start seen people uh start to put energy removal in their cube as an a spec and then oh, uh, okay. make it so that it goes to the lost zone i've seen lost zoning a specs be a really common rule lately and i've liked it a lot because there are a lot of a specs that are interesting and fun cards but they become ridiculous if you can recycle them things like gold potion life do even bot guard. Um, so uh, I really like the lost zoning rule, but um, energy removal just as it is, as a card, totally left unchecked. It literally determines games on the spot. Um, the tempo advantage gained is just so tremendous in many cases. So be very, very cautious. If you are going to include those cards, be very real and very critical about the effects that they're having on the game and do not be afraid to pull the plug and remove those cards from the cube a lot of the time it is going to feel better with those gone than it would have with those in yeah and i think the other thing with those two is um, those cards were not necessarily meant to be played in the game in its current state um it's kind of a common trend for most uh, card games so like the er some of the early set cards tend to be like really solid like black lotus and magic like Dragaki or monster reborn and Yu-Gi-Oh. like some of these cards that first came out were not necessarily meant like for how they are today um so like when you look at energy removal it's basically crushing hammer without the flip uh would be insanely broken today so you have to think about just because it's like the pokemon themselves back then didn't hit that hard those cards themselves are really good so context is always king here and make sure you're thinking about how that's going to impact your cube definitely um which kind of brings into our next thing that the, the trainers themselves need to be uh like sort of like at the power level you're trying to build right in general, I would say yes. So um, the thing is, so I think of it as the power level determines the range of strength that your trainers should generally have. So in low power, um, you have a pretty wide range of trainers because it's not like in low power you shouldn't include like Sycamore, which is a very, very powerful trainer. Uh, Sycamore is a perfectly fine card to include in low power and I would encourage it, but don't encourage it in, or don't play it in super high counts. Put like one in there. It's, you know, super mm -hmm. premium card. And, and it's fine in low power to have, you know, like a How or a Bianca or whatever as your supporter for the turn because deck games are slower, card draw is less prevalent, and it's it's not going to completely define the game. It's not totally required. If you end up behind a turn or two, it's totally fine. Uh, in mid power, it, it goes a little both ways. Um, 
I say generally mid and low power can have pretty similar trainer lines, but once you get up to high power, the the low bar for how strong a trainer needs to be goes way up. Um, right. Your your trainer needs to be getting you cards, needs to be searching you, finding you exactly what you need. Um, and in that case, that's when you start to see like multiples of cards like level ball, quick ball, ultra ball, draw sevens, things like that. That is where you want to be at in a lot of cases in high power and and there's definitely a, a range you can still use in high power like lily is still a fine card in high power but right. it's not what you want most of your trainers to be at yeah and i think that's something very important to consider when you're going back to power level um after you've kind of decided what kind of pokemon you're thinking about doing uh, making sure that you're putting in like the right amount of trainers because i think some people get stuck in like this um almost just like trap of trying to find uh really unique cards which is fun and I, I definitely recommend people experimenting but you get too far into that and like suddenly like your your consistency line is like pokeball nest ball and like maybe like a few ultra balls and like no one no one's gonna have fun when they're losing like that you know so like and if you want to play like a more like singleton s kind of thing maybe consider like a a weaker power level that can you can afford to play you know a higher diversity of cards but don't go into like something like high power expecting you know to be able to like you know touch every era of the game and offer this wide variety of trainers because it's just not going to be conducive for the experience you're looking for um and that, that can be that can be hard like something that i don't have to um adjust on your own now of course if if you're if you're having fun and the cube still works for you by all means keep playing your cube but that's just something you're going to have to consider and it's a battle you're going to have to fight when you're, when you're trying to figure out what your goals are um so take that with you when you're trying to figure out power level too i think that's a good way to determine that yeah, definitely. Um, so then as we're talking about like power level, power level, I know something for me because I have a, power, a high power cube and um, something I, I had to kind of learn as I was going is offering a high variety of like those uh, ultra balls and like sycamores and stuff. Um, I don't, I do think there's a point where it starts to become like cube gluttony and it's <laughs> kind of like you just, you don't want to have it every card be like uh, ultra ball. You know, you can offer variety in the sense of like Maybe you can have like, you know, PCOM, you can have a uh, level ball, nest ball and those kind of things. But you want to make sure that your um, general line is like pretty conducive to like, you know, maybe you have a higher counts of ultra ball, but you maybe you also throw in a premier ball. But you want to also not make sure like you're, uh, you don't want to have like 20 pokeballs in there. Like no one's going to want to play those, right? Right. Um, so then on that, do we have anything else we want to talk about? I guess rare candy is also something that's important. Um, do you usually word it like old candy where you could just, uh, if you're wrong, play it, uh, let's turn the Pokemon slate down? Or is it traditionally like common, like the new candy rules where it's, uh, you know, it's still the uh, evolution where we have to wait a turn? Depends on your era, depends on what your Pokemon do. I generally find that even cubes that are playing older cards predominantly use the new errated rules. Um, so I definitely say the newer rules are more common. Um, just, uh, you know, just be careful around stuff like that. Getting blown out by a turn one candy play is never fun. So, um, if stuff like that happens a lot in your cube or even more than like once or twice, then, uh, you might want to, you might want to make a change there. Yeah, rare candy seems like it can kind of like boost the speed of the cube a lot too, if you're playing old candy, because being able to like go into like a very powerful stage two could be something very like lopsiding if depending on the card definitely and and i would also encourage you to really consider how valuable rare candy is in your cube um it's it's been such a staple of the game for so long that people don't realize that in cube it it's a lot of the time it's not that strong and in other cases it's really just not needed uh in, in high counts so um don't feel like you're obligated to put high counts of something like rare candy in just because it's been so prevalent. Um, you know, change it up. Put in put in fewer candies. Put in none. Um, just uh, try try stuff out. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think rare candy is one of those like cards that it's really funny to see how it's like. It's not you can't play stage two decks today, so. I wonder if players value it who are just coming into the game as opposed to players who maybe played back to like when it was like in every deck when, you know, EXs weren't really a thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. Um, but with all that said, I mean, so it's kind of like sum it up. I mean, be aware of your gust effects. Those are obviously going to be your most important that you want to balance. Aside from that, you know, when you're looking at basic cards, make sure you're evaluating like the 
energy removal and um uh, i can't remember what were the other ones you talked about was it oak it was uh, energy removal super energy removal and gust of wind oak gust can be uh, something to take a look at probably wouldn't include it in any higher of a count than one unless you're playing a wizards of the coast era cube um and in high power it's going to be more problematic than in lower powers where that speed is really huge but usually i find oak to be okay yeah i think that's fair and then also making sure that your you know your power level is match and your trainer quality is like you know matching your power level. So, you know if you're gonna have a very high powered cube, make sure that your trainer cards are gonna allow players to be consistent and fast. But you know if you have a low powered cube, I mean keep in mind like you you know the, how the game is gonna be played. You want to make sure your trainer cards are reflective of that. Um, and then I guess now we can go on to energy. Um, it's kind of like a very open ended thing, right? There's not. Like, there's not as many options for special energy as there are with trainers, right? Right, yeah. There, there's not a ton to say about energy. Uh, You know, kind of go crazy. Play the ones that you want to play. Just make sure that they're, you're, you're not playing super high counts of really powerful special energy in lower power cubes. But you can use really powerful special energy to kind of boost archetypes that need a little bit of a bump in higher power cubes. Um, so the, the one that I always go back to, the one that is always the problem or the definer is strong energy. Um, in a low power cube, you probably want one or zero. <laughs> that, that effect is just so strong. But in a high power cube, maybe you play two or three strong energy. Really give the fighting deck the ability to be aggressive for not a ton of energy. So uh, just, uh, yeah, go, go kind of crazy with energy. See what works. And... Um, just don't uh, don't kind of go crazy in the sense that uh, you know four strong energy or uh, or even four like herbal energy would be crazy just heal 30 every every time you attach but uh, in general there are not a lot of rules with energy play what you like yeah and i guess like the so like the next um thing that we didn't really talk about was like i found a lot of trainers was like when you're talking about like balance between like supporters and like items and then also like stadiums and stuff like do you generally find yourself just finding like what works is there like a certain number you usually aim towards i kind of lean on the fact that i usually have more items than i do uh uh supporters good think of the word and uh, obviously not uh stadiums but i don't usually have a certain count i go for uh i'm curious to see what your thoughts are on that i generally like to see cubes at like 40 ish percent uh trainers 35 you, you can go down to like 35 um but yeah like that 35 to 40 range i think is kind of the golden range as far as supporters and you definitely want the bulk of your trainers just all of them being uh draw or search right. because utility supporters are really important and they help define archetypes and you definitely should have them in their in your queue but they should not be taking a front seat ahead of the consistency cards that need to go in every single deck in high counts for them to work. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think consistency is always like one of the most important things because as a cube uh, owner, you got to think about how people are going to play your cube. If they can't really set up or decks are inconsistent, like, I mean, I'm sure everybody understands that feeling of you spend all this time drafting and then your deck kind of falls flat because either you didn't draft the consistency or there wasn't that much available. And the problem with that also happens when there's not that much consistency available. The people who have, you know, drafted into that generally have a huge advantage, which, again, it just doesn't leave a very fun experience. So always aid on that side that, you know, you can't go wrong having a ton of consistency as you could not having it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, a really good way to put that. Uh, stadiums are kind of a weird uh, mix. There's a lot available. They're not all going to be like there's not i don't i don't see every stadium working its way into like you know all cues but i definitely think you can pick ones that are more like conducive to like your your lines and your archetypes which we'll talk about in a minute uh, i don't think you need to put to you don't need to overthink it but i do think um they do have a place would you say oh yeah i mean stadiums definitely have a place yeah. and some of my favorite cubes have very competitive stadium games, and I think that competitive stadium games are really fun. Uh, I know my cube has really competitive stadiums as well. Uh, so so stadiums that can have a significant effect on the game and stadiums that decks really care about having in play can just increase the, the level of complexity in, in a game and increase the level of skill and interaction that uh, the game can bring. So I really love stadiums. But that said, you should not be above like 5% on, on total yeah. cube count. 
Um, and even 5%, I think, is probably a little high. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the thing I was going to, like, kind of bring up, too, is and you don't want to go, like, overboard with your stadiums. Like, you end up having, like, almost as many stadiums as you do, like, supporters. Like, then you might have a few issues as far as consistency goes. Yeah. Um, but, you know, look through the, you know, look on PKM uh, cards and, like, look at the different stadiums that are out there. And there's a lot of, uh, you, can, you can generate a lot of value, a lot of consistency, and a lot of tactical play through a stadium card. So definitely don't uh, don't underlook them. I think that I mean I guess besides tool cards, so that's kind of its own thing. I mean there are I mean tool cards are tool cards, and there's some really good ones like Cessation Crystal, Crystal. But for the most part, I mean there's ones that are going to be uh, you know really good for certain decks. And uh, what are your thoughts on tools? Uh, I think tools are some of the easily or some of the uh, the most commonly included broken cards in Cube. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cards like Muscle Band um, were very strong in their time period, but they didn't feel broken in their time period. But in Cube, <laughs> they will feel broken in a lot of power levels. Um, in, in low power, Muscle Band can totally just destroy a, a cube. And uh, cards like Hard Charm that were not played very much, if at all, competitively are all-stars in, in a lot mm. of power levels in Cube. Even in high power, I've seen Hard Charm completely decide games. Um, so really really keep an eye on your tools i will say the number one most powerful pokemon tool in cube is rock guard uh yeah. a card that was i it saw little to no competitive play in any era uh but uh because tool removal is so rare and because your opponent's gonna have so few options to actually get around a rock guard like gus uh, you you need to make sure that that rock guard doesn't just totally decide the game right there. Uh, well, so uh, keep keep an eye on your tools because a lot of broken tools end up in cubes where they maybe should not be. I think the other thing too that's important is like if you think about like the damage you take from rock guard if you're like an EX Pokemon and like black and white it's probably just like less significant than like when it's like half your HP in like you know cube setting. The yeah. damage, I think, is, like, way more relevant. Same thing with, like, Muscle Band. Even, like, Fighting Fury Belt can be a problem if it's, you know, being abused on, like, a big basic. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. You know, tools are definitely um, they're kind of a class of their own, but you want to make sure you're um, cognizant of what tools are in your cube and potentially try to find, th like, you know, try to sniff out any problems beforehand. Of course, you know, every cube owner knows that there's always something that's going to break whenever you take it to, like, the table. So, can't always get everything out of the way, but you know you can take some time and think about well, if I attach a fighting fury belt to this buzzwall, is it gonna even compete? Is I can any other lines compete with that? You know, if no, then obviously you know what you need to cut. Um, but you know, definitely don't uh, don't discount the fact that you know stuff like muscle band and rock hard can have a significant influence on the game, even if they didn't have that same influence when they were popular. So then I guess like we're kind of through, I guess, all the Pokemon and the trainers and the energy. And I guess any general tips you want to provide, Connor, for building the cube? Yeah, yeah. Just a few little general tips. They can go a really long way when you're actually building your cube and when you're in practice as opposed to in theory. Um, first and foremost, build your cube around archetypes and strategies. Uh, don't, don't just yes. build your cube around types. Make it so that decks do things. They, they're not just like, you know, a fighting stage two that deals some damage and is fighting type. But that, those lines are not that interesting. They're not that memorable. But if you have, like, say, a, like a fighting stage two that buffs your other fighting Pokemon or, like, a fighting stage two that blocks some damage or maybe it, like, accelerates some energy, then you you start to have aspects of the deck that you can build your deck around. You have aspects of the deck that you can push and make powerful. Uh, you have aspects of the deck that other decks can try and counter. And, and things like that make Cube really interesting and, and complex. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Andrew? Yeah, I think um, it becomes a lot more fun to build Cubes, too, when you're starting to think about the strategy of decks. And what's nice about Pokemon itself, because the game's been around for so long, that even, like, gra Grass is not a good example, but, like, Water Stage 2s, like, there's a lot of different archetypes within that one type that you can go. Like, you have stuff like Kingdra, which is a lot more, like, kind of spread-heavy. But then you have stuff like Blastoise, which is a lot more like energy spread and, you know, flooding the board because you have like, you think you'll lose. So even with that, there's like a lot of ideas you can play off of. So definitely don't get locked into the fact that like, okay, I need a water stage two. Let me just pick this line of Pokemon because they all have cards that are on the same HP. 
you know, really, you can kind of dig in there and get, you know, kind of like nitpicky on what strategy you're going for. Definitely. I think that that is what is going to make your cube great, is having archetypes and strategies that are interesting, that are fun, that go beyond just being a type. Now, I think this gets tricky, though, uh, when you're thinking about, like, um, the cube itself. I know it's like some people will, like, make it so, like, okay, maybe this line and fire works with, like, this line and, like, colorless, but, like, the two have to work together to actually make a deck. Like, you kind of have to have the lines be, like, self-serving on their own, right? Yes, and, and if you do want to require certain lines to have other cards in different li uh, different strategies or different lines, then just make sure there are enough of them in the cube that you can reasonably get at least one. So for example, in my cube, I have Mighty Enna from Platinum, which has a body that says if it has a special condition, all of its attacks are free. Um, I have three separate poison enablers in the cube that that all can poison your own mighty enna um so so you're able to actually develop that strategy reliably if you end up going for it uh, and i think that's just the big takeaway just like make sure decks can work without any ridiculous requirement yeah i think what's a common trap that i find people get into is like linchpin cards and by that i mean like one card in line is what makes the whole deck and that becomes super easy to hate draft, and that can tend to lead to a ton of issues very, later very on. True. It's nothing feels worse than like having like three of the four line for your Pokemon line, and then you don't have the one card that makes the whole line work, and then you're like, cool, I guess I'm sitting on these other Pokemon, and I have I don't really have a deck. So just be mindful of that, and that kind of influences like the strategy and the experience people are gonna have. Like, make sure that your lines can work if like one card wasn't a part of it, which it's definitely possible. The cards are definitely out there, and that's just something to look for yeah and i mean there are going to inevitably ca be cases where a line is significantly stronger if it has all four but it right. at least needs to be able to do something without all four um i've seen uh i've seen lines where there are four line toppers um all of them have energy costs of three or greater and then there's one rain dance stage two in the line Mm -hmm. And and the idea is essentially that the attack costs are mitigated by the rain dance, except rain dance is so powerful. The odds that you don't get that rain dance is, are not that low. <laughs> so you 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 know commit to this line, you draft it, and then in the end you don't get your rain dance, and you're like, wow, my deck is atrocious now. Uh, you nobody ever wants to be in that situation. Nope, and it, it feels it feels so bad. You're, you're like I wasted all of this time drafting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like I know I'm about to go O three. Like, um, so then like with that too, I think um, uh, and we talked about this before, but I think it's worth just repeating is that make sure like you're almost don't go too light on consistency. Like consistency is probably one of the if not the influencers on how people are going to enjoy your cube. Like if you're if you don't have that available consistency, like crawl and search, regardless of how strong it is then players aren't necessarily going to be able to build consistent decks. If players can't build consistent decks, then it's not going to be as fun as it usually, then it would be. Um, because no one really wants to sit all their draft, like draft for like an hour and then like, you know, be left with just a mess of cards. Um, so think about that. Think about how people are going to interpret that. Um, basically make sure you have an abundance of appropriate trainers for your cube and that everyone has access to them. Definitely. Do you have any other thoughts on that, Connor? No, I think you've pretty much covered the consistency angle, um, but uh, kind of continuing, uh, cards are not always as strong as they were when they were in Constructed. Um, so especially calling out examples like Broken Time Space and Battle Compressor, those cards were tremendously impactful cards when they were in Standard, but in Cube, they're like fine sometimes, and then mm -hmm. a lot of the time they're just not good. Um Broken Time Space has a couple of really neat uses in uh, in like decks that have a lot of scoop up effects and want to evolve Pokemon and then pick them back up. But uh, Battle Compressor has similarly niche uses. Either way, they are not the dominant cards in Cube that they are in Standard, and there are a lot of cards like that. Like Rare Candy is not as powerful. Um, and uh, and Andrew, would you do you have any thoughts on that? I think context is always going to be the most important factor. So stuff like Broken Time Space when it was played, it was definitely really good. 
that's because like the decks it was getting played in was like obviously going to help uh in cube you don't have the same options um you have to make sure that you're just thinking about you know just because the card was good at one point like battle compressor um unless you're playing night march right it's not necessarily the same like effect that that card had when it first came out well, obviously battle compressor has a lot of other effects than night march but you know uh, in cube, it's a different ball game. You know, you have access to different cards. Uh, you're not building your deck around using Battle Compressor. So, uh, think about the context of those cards you're putting in your cube, and make sure that they're, you know, they're gonna work with the decks that you have in there. Because sometimes these cards could be really good, but it's not necessarily a guarantee. Definitely. Um, and on the flip side, some cards are, are much stronger than when they oh, were in Oh, absolutely. Um, things like Alolan Vulpix. That is that is the number one. Now that was played in standard some. But uh, in cube, it's it's like pretty much the strongest support basic there is, uh, and uh, and then other cards. So another example that I like to reference is Machamp Break. That card, I mean, a lot of people that played when it was around probably didn't even know it existed. There's a solid chance that I didn't um, until I you know read about it for cube. But uh, Machamp Break, three energy for a hundred, and then next turn deal two hundred, and no drawback. Uh, in standard that was horrendous in cube that will literally just demolish almost every deck even in high power so uh be be very conscious of things like that there are cards that are way more powerful in cube than in constructed yeah i think it just all comes down to context right you just gotta make sure that you understand like how does how does any card play with the field of cards you have available that's always what's going to come down to definitely context is the big thing and then I think kind of like one of the last things is just, you know, it's okay to experiment and try new things. Like we've, we've given a lot of information throughout the course of the segment, but you know, there's nothing, there's always room to like change up your cube and try out new ideas, you know, just to even generate more fun. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always try new stuff out. If, if you are really, really happy with where your cube is at, then you don't necessarily need to change anything, but you know, if, if even one person at the table maybe didn't have a great time, now you don't necessarily have to change your whole cube. You don't even have to change anything. But you can look at the reasons why they didn't have a good time. And you can see, you know, if there are some things in the cube that you might be able to change so that that doesn't happen next time. Um, and, and even if your cube is in a great spot balance-wise, you could still decide to make some changes just to keep things fresh and keep using new cards and keep things interested for yourself and for the people you're playing with. So, uh, you know, make changes, try, try stuff out. Yeah. And I think it also kind of goes into like, if you're going to have, you know, people draft it and you want feedback, just be receptive and, you know, be understanding if someone has, you know, someone has a, if you disagree with someone says that's okay. Um, but also, you know, understand that your perspective as a cube owner could be heavily biased. And if your goal is for everyone to have fun, maybe, you know, be be at least open to the idea of making changes um as needed obviously like kind of said you don't have to change your whole cube just because someone didn't like it i mean that's that's just the part of cube it's very you know everyone's got their different tastes but also you know make sure if there's a persistent problem like if let's just say one line is consistently dominating the the field and um you you might be really attached to that one line be a little bit understanding to like where people are coming from when you know maybe it's not as much fun to always lose to the same deck um, and those instances, you want to make sure you're, um, if you're, if it's in the interest of, you know, having fun, make sure that you're, you know, being, you know, at least a little bit diligent about you know, listening to feedback like that, I would say. I would definitely agree. Yeah. You're, you know, at the end of the day, if your play group is not having a good time for one reason or another, then, then that is a problem. <laughs> um, you know, if, if somebody got salty and didn't have a good deck one time, that's not your fault, but if you are consistently having issues where people say, my deck didn't set up, I lost to this one specific archetype that was just way more powerful than me, stuff like that, those are the things you really need to look out for. And and those are the kind of things that you can look at as concrete examples of when you need to nerf a line or switch a line out or make it better so that everybody at the table can have a good time every time. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it, I mean, like, it's not easy sometimes to get any feedback, like, Especially if you're, you know, really attached to something or like, you know, you thought something might have been really good and it turned out not going over well. And that's okay. I mean, like, my advice to to any new cube owner is fail quickly. Like, it's better to just make the mistakes now and like even if your cube isn't perfect and learn from those mistakes than to worry about like everything being perfect up the bat. Because then you're never gonna draft your cube. So 
even with all that said, and like we've given a lot of like, you know, be cautious for this, watch out for that. It's okay if you make those mistakes. In fact, like I, I know I, I know I can say for me, I've definitely made probably almost I've made all of them <laughs> as I've gone through <laughs> my cube. But you know, at the other I've come out of the other side, I'm really happy with how my cube's turned out. And I have a lot of I've had a lot of fun drafting it over the years and you grow also as a player through these experiences too. So don't be afraid to like jump into this format and if you're really passionate about building a cube, like I know we just kind of jumped a bunch of information on you and don't feel overwhelmed, uh, even though it is a lot. Um, just kind of take it piece by piece. You know, it's that expression that how do you, you know, eat an elephant, which is, I think is a weird expression anyway, but it's, you know, you take it in pieces. Don't try to like, you know, understand everything at once. You're only going to get frustrated. Just like, you know, get started, you know, put some cards together. I mean, hopefully this was a guideline at least on how to do that. But uh, once you build your queue, play it. See what happens. Maybe there's going to be something broken. Maybe there's something goopy that's going to happen that you didn't expect to happen. Those just make for better stories. So if you take anything away from this, it's just get started now and just jump in. Get, um, you know, have fun. Definitely. Yeah. Number one in cube is, uh, is have fun. And number two is that as a cube builder, you're going to make mistakes. It is mm -hmm. unavoidable. Uh, so, so just be ready for that. Be receptive to what people say when you do and, and you'll have a great time. I think that's going to wrap up this segment on just how to build a queue. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? I know we kind of got done with that. Uh, I, I think my thoughts are <laughs> pretty well laid out. Um, we've definitely gone on for quite a while. So, uh, so please give us feedback. Um, tell us, you know, if any of our advice was useful to you in the comments on whatever platform you are viewing on. And, uh, and that's, that's all I've got for now. Sweet. And like I said, this was a, like kind of was like a, you know, crash course into how to build a cube. Uh, we'll include resources to, uh, other articles written about, uh, uh, building a cube itself, just so you can reference too, as you go forward. Um, yeah, so we'll just take a small break, and then when we come back, we're actually going to dissect the cube and talk about some of the exciting lines and some of the power level and just kind of put a lot of what we said into practice. So stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to Peak Cube, the one and only Pokemon Cube podcast. If you want to get notified when future episodes of Peak Cube are out, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification. We appreciate all your support and look forward to bringing you more Cube content in the future. Now, on to the next segment. All right, welcome back. So now you have a pretty clear idea of what a cube is. I think now it'd be cool to talk about uh, an actual cube and see what makes that what makes up those pieces. So today we have a Connor's cube uh, that we're going to be using for the Champions cube. And Connor, you want to talk about your cube? What's it about? Your power level and that sort of thing? Yeah. So my cube is right about mid power level, um, depending on how uh, how well the decks come together. Sometimes it can feel a little bit higher or a little bit lower. But uh, it's really heavily based on synergies. There are tons and tons of different synergies that different lines have. You can draft so many different things and put them in the same deck and uh, have it come out really interestingly and, and very well. The cube is built to be that way. So um, I intentionally did that. And then I also intentionally included a bunch of my favorite cards from cube format. So I'm not really a competitive Pokemon player anymore. I don't have a lot of experience with cards on the day-to-day -day except for cube. So um, I took a lot of the cards that have been some of my favorites to run in cube and I put them into this cube. So a lot of the time I'll call it like a best of cube because it's uh, just all of my favorite cube cards. So did you like start with the idea that you wanted a lot of synergies or how did you get started with the cube itself? So I've always been a big proponent of building your cube around archetypes, not around types. Um, right. So my first thing was that I wanted to I wanted to use Pokemon that people didn't use that much, and I succeeded somewhat. I think I do have a lot of unique Pokemon, but it's they're not totally unique. There are a couple of archetypes that I really love that are pretty popular. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to put a cube together using all of the stuff that I had played with over the last two years, all my favorite archetypes, and uh, make it something really unique and, and interesting. And I think that's something you see a lot when people start building their cube. There's always some sort of intention behind it, whether it is to play a certain power level or utilize certain Pokemon that you like to see. I know we covered some of that in the previous segment. But I think it's really cool to see you know, what your favorite parts of the game is coming out in like this cube. Uh, I think it's pretty reflective about that. Um, 
So without further ado, do you want to let's start talking about these different lines you have? Um, so let's start with grass. Sure. So victory bell. You want to talk about the different victory bells you have in this cube? Yeah, definitely. So victory bell is the stage two grass line. I have the one from Guardians Rising, uh, the one from X Y three, which is the set after Flash Fire. <laughs> My memory is really bad. I uh, I know these cards for from the drafter sets. Yes. Or yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, the victory bell from with Nectar Pod. I'll, I'll just I'll just talk about their powers. Uh, the victory bell with tangling tendrils from Hard Gold Soul Silver, and that's that's the full four. So the strategy is primarily condition based. Uh, you want to inflict your opponent with poison, confusion, burn, sometimes even, um, especially the Guardians Rising Victory Bell being your most powerful attacker with grass for twenty burn, confuse, and poison. Uh, something about my cube is that any Pokemon with uh, or any stage two Pokemon with one hundred forty or more HP is worth two prizes. So um, I've made any of the Pokemon that have one hundred forty HP fairly significantly more powerful on the attacking side too so that it really feels like they're worth it even though you know they, they don't just feel like they have 10 more health they feel like they're an ex um so that's definitely your your like center point card is that guardians rising victory bell um but the other angles that you can take with the deck are like a healing angle because there is floral heal shaman you can pair it with shining legends manaphy get an extra 20 heal every turn some of the vic uh, yeah some of the victory bells themselves have heal 20s on the attacks and uh and that kind of lends itself to this tank strategy as well just the healing in the tank hand in hand you know one of these victory bells has 140 hp there are no ways to boost grass type pokemon hp i don't have like land form shaman level x or anything but overall those are kind of the three big characterizing things you see with victory bell yeah and it seems like then we go into your if your grass stage one kind of plays in that too with ariados yeah, it does. So Ariados is a much more aggressive take on conditions, whereas Victory Bell is slower. It has very big, bulky top end Pokemon, and it has healing. Ariados doesn't doesn't care about healing. It doesn't even really care about surviving that much. It just wants to deal as much damage as fast as possible. So it has two of the Ancient Origins Ariados with Poisonous Nest that allows you to poison your opponent's active Pokemon every turn. If your active is Grass, then you are not poisoned. However. As we see later in the cube, sometimes you actually do want to poison yourself if you're not playing grass. So that does come up. Um, and then three of the Unseen Forces Reactive Poison Ariados. Uh, for one colorless, it deals 10 plus 30 for each special condition affecting the defending Pokemon. So if you just have the poison, if you have no other modifiers, it's going to be 50 damage after poison. However, there are lots of other ways to inflict statuses in this cube. Uh, so you can often get it up to 70 damage without too much difficulty. And then you start factoring in things like Burbank City Gym, of which there are two in the cube, all kinds of different modifiers that you can get to work with Ariados to make its damage even higher. The downside, of course, is that you have a 70 HP primary attacker, and that's not going to get you very far yeah. in those cases. It's going to get knocked out pretty fast. So you can take advantage of some of the other things like Shaman Level X with Revenge Seed in the cube, uh, it's going to allow you to deal 110 damage for only two energy, which is a crazy, crazy good rate, but only after one of your grass Pokemon is knocked out. So you can see how Ariados kind of plays into that, where you know your Ariados is going to get knocked out, so you use Shaman Level X, which is another cheap and powerful attacker, to really push that edge. And uh, and you stay super aggressive all game long. It's basically your goal. Oh, right on. So I think something, too, that kind of comes up in different cubes, and it feels like uh, I see it different ways, is, like, uh, having multiple copies of the same attacker. Um, there's definitely, like, both good and bad to it. Um, it definitely is, like, I guess you could say less interesting, per se, because it's the same attacker. But it, I think, for, like, you're trying to, like, make the cube gameplay more interesting, having something more, like, like this strategy is, you know, a lot easier to you know pull off when you have more available attackers like that. Like, what is your stance on uh, repeating attackers in cube? So I think it depends on what you're trying to do with cube, and I de it depends on what kind of cube you have. Um, for this mm -hmm. cube, it, it's really critical to have more than one of any given attacker for a line if that attacker defines a line. So there are singleton lines in the cube, but in certain lines, like Ariados, the entire line is defined by the ability to inflict poison, and take advantage of that poison that you've inflicted. 
So, uh, you know, I want that deck to work. If somebody ends up with those cards, I want them to be able to successfully pull off that strategy. And for that reason, I make it much more feasible to do that by including more of those cards that let you actually do that and less fluff. Um, I, I like that. I like that a lot, actually. It, I think it definitely is very good if you know what kind of strategies are probably going to exist in your cube and you know what strategies you want to exist in your cube as well. And that's not to say that people can't think outside the box because they, they certainly do and they certainly will. Um, but right. it means that you can definitely say like this, this type's theme or this line strategy is this, and you can be very deliberate in that way and you can make it consistent if people draft, you know, the pieces. So, um, it makes it so that your draft doesn't hinge on one card very often. And overall, I just like it a lot. In general, I like it a lot, but uh, especially in this cube. Yeah, I think that's, I'm glad you touched on that because uh, that's something I think when you're designing a cube, uh, you might look at different Pokemon lines. And sometimes, like maybe a line like Ariados has, like the cards you have are very good. And you might not think to put like multiple copies of. Uh, uh, reactive poison, but it's totally acceptable to do that. Again, it's all about your own preference, but I think sometimes you can play with the lines in a way that makes it, you know, more enjoyable to draft and play, even if it means, like, you know, you don't have to stick to, like, a singleton strategy. So, just something to bear in mind. I think that's, you know, worth talking about. And, and one other thing that I think it really helps with is balancing, because yeah. if you try to go total singleton, then it either is going to really limit your line selection a lot, because you're only going to be able to play Pokemon or Pokemon that have, you know, four or five unique copies, and they're all relatively within the same kind of power constraints. And Pokemon just hasn't been around for that long in in, in the grand scheme of things. And sure. um, as a result of that, you don't have the massive card pool that you would with a game like Magic, uh, especially because Pokemon's power creep has definitely been prevalent over the years. Um, you definitely could not compare a card from the Wizards of the Coast era, even really to the EX era. I mean, they're two different worlds. So when you, you know, go era after era after era, it's going to be really hard to, I mean, you, you limit the scope of your cube a lot by saying, I will only play a singleton line because you make it so that you are really going to have to find exactly where the balance lines up for every singleton line in your cube. So it can make it a lot I, I easier to balance. I think the other thing too is that not every Pokemon is going to get printed in every set. Like there's 800 Pokemon, so Ariados will probably get a new card maybe once every who knows how many sets. So even just to find you know Pokemon with a good line itself is like already difficult. So you do kind of have to push some boundaries to make it work at times. But you know there's nothing wrong with that. I think it ends up being a way better cube experience. Yeah, definitely. And I, I don't know. I think you know different cubes perform in different ways. You have different goals for everybody. Right. But um, in a cube like this, where certain strategies, I, I definitely want those strategies to exist and be reasonably able to be pulled off. Um, it's really helpful. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so let's talk about the next type of fire, the chandelier. That's the one you don't commonly see in cubes. At least that's the one I haven't seen in a lot of cubes. Yeah, Chandelure is a little bit weird. Um, so most of the stage two lines in this cube are singleton. Uh, the chandelier line is singleton as well. So um, I have the Cursed Shadow Chandelure from Noble Victories that was very powerful when it came out. Uh, I have the Fainting Spell Chandelure from Phantom Forces. I have the Flare Navigate Chandelure, the Plasma one. And then I have the Chandelure with Flame Burst and Inferno. So the idea here, they're, they're kind of two modes to Chandelure, but they work together if you need them to or if you want them to as well. So you have two of the Chandelures are fire and two are psychic, and they have attack costs that represent their types. So, But the Flare Navigate Chandelure really helps round out the acceleration on the psychic type ones because you have at least one colorless energy requirement in each of their attacks. And for the Fainting Spell one, you actually have two. So a lot of the time what you can do is you can use that to accelerate your psychic attackers. In addition to that, the Flame Burst one that deals 30-30-30 it makes it, or it lines up really well with your spread synergies that you are going to use in the rest of the deck and that you're going to use in the rest of the line. However, the other angle is to use that Flare Navigate Chandelure with some really large fire basics that are in the cube 
and use kind of like a, a fire toolbox angle. You can play Mag Mortar in that. You can play a couple of different fire attackers or colorless attackers that use fire energy, things like Lugia EX, Rayquaza EX, uh, Moltres EX, and just all kinds of different stuff. So those are, those are I would say, kind of the two modes of Chandelure. And I've seen both played. Um, the spread angle won the Cube League when we played this cube for it. And the fire one did very well in the team cube that we ran this for. So um, both angles, totally powerful, totally viable. It just depends on how your deck works out and what you want to do. So speaking of big fire boys, your stage one is Mag Mortar. Yeah, yeah. So I love Mag Mortar. Mag Mortar level X is one of the, the first cards that I had in like a semi-decent deck when I was playing Pokemon for the very first time. Uh, so I, I have a soft spot for Mag Mortar, but I also really like what the line does in Cube, and I like how it synergizes with some of the condition-based stuff. I like how it synergizes with the Chandelure. I like how it synergizes with the Fire Basics. So it, it mm -hmm. really is a nice partner for a lot of different things. Uh, so I play two Mag Mortar level X, really powerful card. You have a power that lets you kind of super burn your opponent's active if Mag Mortar is active every turn. Uh, and that is three damage instead of two on a failed flip. And then it has flame bluster for four fire. You can discard two fire attached to it and deal 100 damage anywhere, which is a super powerful snipe. And it's a really high attack cost to balance it out. But with some of the acceleration angles, you can absolutely make that happen. It's, it's not totally off the table. It's not something that you're going to be able to loop like all the time, but it's something that you can reasonably do, you know, a couple of times in a game. Um, and then moving on to the uh, the smaller Mag Mortars, not the level Xs, we have two of the Mag Mortars from Secret Wonders with Flame Body and Flame Blast. These guys are really neat because they actually, again, play to both sides of fire. They have an attack that is just 20 times the number of fire energy attached to Mag Mortar, which, you know, scales really well with acceleration. And then they have a body that heals 20 damage every time you attach an energy to Mag Mortar, which, uh, again, plays really well with Acceleration, also makes your Mag Mortars harder to kill, makes it easier to build up a lot of energy on one Mag Mortar. And then the second attack is Fireball Bazooka, which is uh, Fire Colorless Colorless for 40, and then 20 to 2 of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So that plays to that spread angle. Um, so I like that Mag Mortar a lot, that's why I have two of them in the queue. It's kind of the, the defining member of the line. I also have a Mag Mortar with Flame Screen. Uh, that's one Fire for 40, Block 20, and then Fire Colorless, Colorless Flamethrower for 90, and you discard an energy attached to it. So just a general good card. I've seen that played in a lot of Stage 1 decks, in addition to actually be put, being played with the Mag Mortar line as a whole. And then I have the... This is more of an Ariados partner than anything, but it, it's still powerful in a lot of different decks. Uh, the Evolutionary Flame Mag Mortar... Uh, I believe it is from Supreme Victors. When you evolve it, you can uh, burn and confuse your opponent's active. So if you're playing something like Ariados, it can be like a like a six plus power play to just be able to evolve the Mag Mortar and put two more conditions on your opponent's active Pokemon. So Reactive Poison is going to suddenly deal 100 damage if you're able to poison them as well, which is super, super powerful. Um, both of its attacks are fine, 2 for 30 snipe, and then 3 for 60, and you can move an energy off of it. It's a nice backup attacker, De generally not the one that you're going to want to use to attack. You're going to want to use it for its power more than anything else, but totally serviceable. It's not like you're going to be miserable to be attacking with that one. It's just not ideal. Yeah. So yeah, yeah so then you also, you also have, uh, you also have like, two copies of Heatran and Level X in there too, right? I do, yeah. So all of the basic Level Xs are at least too thick. Um, so Heatran is a 2-2 line, and what it does is it makes all of your opponent's burn flips tails when it's in play, which is really nice with Mag Mortar. It can also be nice with, like, uh, Ariados or anything like that that just frequently inflicts burn. And then it also has a power at, which says when you discard fire or metal energy from your active for an attack cost, you can reattach two of them. So that synergizes really well with the Mag Mortar, with some of the Pokemon like Lugia, uh, anything that would want to discard energy as part of its attack, it's a really great synergy piece with that. So just another enabler for that kind of combo. 
Yeah, I mean, I like use of lots of like different like like you said modes. I think it, I think it adds to the replayability because you're able to then, you know, play lines and different styles that maybe appeal to you. And like when you come back to the cube, you have new things you can try. So I definitely appreciate the uh, you know diversity and strategies that you can have with fire. I think that's cool. Yeah, that was something that I really wanted to prioritize throughout the whole cube is I, I wanted there to feel like there were lots of unique strategies that were all powerful enough to win. And that's kind of been a, yeah, I, a leading idea behind my design philosophy. That's kind of one thing that, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun when you have options. I think that's something that's true in all card games is whenever you can play different strategies, like the way that you really want to play it or, you know, and cube too, and especially when you're drafting, there's a lot of variance that can happen, especially if you think about how cards wheel to you and what you can maybe see or not see. So you want to kind of have that alternate strategy in your back pocket. Like, if you're drafting Chandelier, you might not get all of the Chandeliers to make, you know, one big Chandelier deck. But you might have partners, like you, know, like you said, that you can pair with it and make, you know, a, a good spread deck in itself. So I think that's where focusing on the, the the strategies over just, like, the types, I think, really comes into play here. Yeah, definitely. And, and it both allows you to kind of play a very focused deck with just one main line, uh, but it also allows you to play a line with other partners. And... There's a lot of replayability in that, and I think that that just makes it really interesting too, because both versions can be made really powerful, and it just you have to assess during the draft what cards you're seeing and uh, and you know what cards you want to play for that draft. So I like the the modality of that a lot. For sure. Now let's get into your your water types. Now you have one of my favorite lines in there, and that's Kingdra. <laughs> yeah, I I love Kingdra. So uh, another thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of break some norms as far as what lines did. So I think that generally with Victory Bell, I really wanted some cheap attacks and I, I found the Guardians mm -hmm. Rising Victory Bell and that was what I wanted because I think in general grass stage twos are kind of big and kind of heavy. They take a little while to get up, but you get a big payoff. I wanted something that could attack pretty fast. Um, and, and that's the case again with water. I think water lines in general focus a lot on accelerating energy, you know, getting a couple of big water attackers and being able right. to, you know, maybe move that energy around or heal, you know, it's essentially you take some time, you get a good payoff with Kingdra. Kingdra is, is probably the most aggressive stage two line in the queue. I say probably it just is <laughs> Kingdra is definitely right, the most right. aggressive stage two in the queue. Um, so I have two Kingdra from legends awakened. Uh, originally I had one dragon one in here. It was a little bit too strong. It didn't break anything, but it just didn't feel good to play against. Um, that was a tri bullet. Yeah. Yeah. The tri bullet one, which that was an good. EX. So, you know, you, you get more for it, but, uh, still probably, uh, it, it was on the suspect list and I eventually just cut it. Uh, Fair enough. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Two kingdra from legends awakened. It's got aqua stream, which is a zero energy attack. Search your discard for as many water energy as you like. And then shuffle them into show, show them to your opponent. Shuffle them into your deck. You deal ten times the number of energy you shuffled, uh, which can be really great because its second attack, Dragon Pump, is forty, and then you can optionally uh, for one water, and you can optionally discard two cards from your hand. And if you do, you deal sixty damage instead of forty, and you deal twenty damage to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So really, really energy efficient attack. One for sixty snipe twenty is an insane rate in this cube. And Kingdra can do it, you know, every single turn. And then if you mm -hmm. want, you can discard those energies. You can fill up your discard, and then you can get a powerful Aqua Stream later on for 100 or more damage. So you do have a little bit of that late game payoff that it's hard to pull off, but you, you do have something there. Uh, and then the other Kingdra in the line is Kingdra Prime. Uh, that has 130 HP, power, spray splash. Essentially, you can put one damage counter on your opponent's Pokemon however you like uh, each turn. There are two of them in the cube, uh, one for 60. If your opponent has any fires in play, it's instead 20 damage. So uh, Kingdra Prime is really not a good tech against fire, uh, which no, is... No, not at all. <laughs> it's the opposite. <laughs> right, right. It's kind of funny in that way, but um, it's really there for the spread synergy. And then also it, you know, one for 60, again, very, very good rate, especially no cost to you to use it. You don't have to discard anything, anything like that. So the whole Kingdra line is basically get up as fast as possible and deal as much damage as fast as possible without having to spend an insane amount. 
And because Kingdra's attack costs are so low, you can pair it with some really neat stuff like uh, Palkia G level X. You can even pair it with like Regigigas level X. Pokemon that need the, or have these big attack costs where you kind of sit there and you're like, well, I don't really need to attach another energy to a Kingdra for the turn because what am I going to do with it? Like I don't benefit from right. having that extra energy on. So you can play it with some big guys and kind of sit them on the bench. And then that improves your late game and it improves your damage cap. And it also gives you somewhere to put your energy every turn. So um, you can definitely take that angle with Kingdra. And you can also take this tank angle instead and use cards like Rough Seas, Shining Legends, Manaphy, um, Scoop Up Effects, because Kingdra is so cheap to set up. You don't have to worry about the drawback of scooping it up. So you can play it with cards like Briny's Compassion, like AZ, that allow you to repeatedly pick up your Kingdras and then put them back down and then you kind of delay your opponent's prizes in that way, and then you can, you know, mitigate the lower damage output that you have toward, like, the mid and late game. So those are kind of the two angles you generally take with Kingdra. I like it. Um, now you have, like, the next line that I don't think I've ever seen before in a cube, <laughs> and that's Golduck. That's really interesting. Tell me about that. So I, I love Golduck. I think it's a line with a ton of potential in cube, I think people don't really play it because it's not that popular for starters. Um, right. You know, people like to play I with. I like Golduck. Yeah. I, I've never, I, I actually probably don't know what any of these cards do actually besides maybe with Break. <laughs> yeah. Be people like to play with their favorites, you know, and I can't blame them for that whatsoever. But um, it, it does make it so that Pokemon that are, you know, kind of in the middle of the road or slightly more forgettable like Golduck uh, don't get as much love in Cube. And I think Golduck has a lot of really cool cards, so I wanted to feature it. Uh, so the line topper is two copies of Golduck Break. 140 HP water Pokemon. Uh, it does not count as a two-prizer. Uh, breaks and level Xs are excluded from that rule. So, uh, And then you have an ability that allows you to move your basic energy around on your board as much as you want in a turn, which has so many possibilities <laughs> because it's right. any type it's of any basic energy, energy. right? Right. Yeah. So you can use any type of acceleration. You can use any types of attackers. Uh, <laughs> the world is kind of your oyster in that respect. You can essentially pick whatever attackers you want to enable, and then you can use Golduck to enable those attackers. So uh, there are a lot of accelerators in the cube that are like basics that accelerate from deck for one energy. Uh, there's also Shadow Charge Weavile that searches your deck for dark energy. You can use that with Golduck really effectively, or you can just, you know, go turn after turn if you have some good healing or good scoop ups or whatever, uh, anything even that lets your Pokemon retreat for free. You can, um, you can just gradually attach turn after turn and maybe avoid a knockout here and there. And then you've built up five, six energies with attachments. So uh, a couple of ways that you can develop that. But uh, the rest of the Golduck line, it is Singleton is um the Golduck with it's from an xy set it has water for 20 damage derail discard a special energy attached to your opponent's active and then water colorless colorless for 70 um it's it's a basically just a really middle of the road stage one it's techable in a lot of different decks because it's just got one water it hits fire stuff for weakness which can be really big um, and the special energy removal effect can be solid against some decks. It's not a standout card. It's not necessarily supposed to be. Um, then the probably the strongest Golduck in the line is uh, Golduck from SM12, which is after I quit playing. So I, I have no idea what that set is. It might be like Unified Minds or Clo Cosmic Eclipse. Or oh, something. Cosmic Eclipse. Um, but it has 110 HP, which is pretty high for a stage one. Uh, one for 30, Scratch, and then Watercolorless Energy Loop for 80, which is a very, very good rate on a Stage 1 especially, but you have to put an Energy Attached to Golduck into your hand, so you're kind of stalling your board while you use Energy Loop. Uh, in an aggressive deck, it can be great, but in a deck that needs to build up more energy, it's, it's a lot harder to use effectively. And then we have the Golduck from Platinum. It has a zero energy attack swim for 30 damage. And if your opponent has any water Pokemon in play, you can snipe for 30 instead. And then water slide, which is water colorless 40 plus. And if you move all the energy attached to Golduck to one of your bench Pokemon, you can deal an additional 20 damage. That can actually synergize really well with Golduck break. If you want to be able to deal solid damage, 60 damage is a pretty solid attack. Then 
not endanger any of your energy. So if you expect your Golduck to go down for whatever reason, you can use this Golduck, you can move the energy off of it, and then Golduck Break is of course gonna be able to move that energy wherever you want next turn. So there are a lot of different things that you can do with this Golduck that are not immediately obvious. And then the free attack cost is always nice as well. And the last Golduck is the Golduck from Sky Ridge or Aquapolis, I believe. Um, or no, 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 it's, it's from Sandstorm? I believe Sandstorm. Uh, it has a Poke Power Chaos Flash. If it's active, you can flip a coin and if heads it confuses the defending Pokemon. Um, so this is really powerful for a couple of reasons. If you do break evolve this Golduck, then you can use that on the with the break, which is really nice. It's going to be a way to slow your opponent down. You can also use it if you have a Float Stone with Ariados. It can be a pivot. So you can go into Golduck, you can Chaos Flash, and then if you get a Heads, then that's another three plus powers for free. Uh, and then nice. it, its attack is pretty good too. It's Special Blow, uh, Water Psychic for 30, but if the defending Pokemon has any special energy attached, then it's uh, one, two for 70. So... Uh, two for 70, again, really good rate on a stage one attacker. So Golduck is interesting. It's it's a little bit harder to build a deck with just Golduck. In fact, I would say it's not that feasible. Uh, but Golduck can be the glue or a tech attacker for a lot of different strategies. So it does end up seeing quite a bit of play, just not on its own. Yeah, I think that's what makes it interesting is that like it's not necessarily the deck that's going to be maybe centered around Golduck, but it's going to probably find its way into many other decks, which... It inherently be really strong too because you know it's going to see play in a variety of decks instead of just like one specific archetype i think that's really cool a lot of interesting lines you could play with a lot of ways you could go yeah and i feel like golduck is a line that hasn't really had its potential tapped a ton um oh not at all they're they're flashier lines in the cube and especially on their first couple of run throughs people kind of go after that but people really started to experiment with Golduck and Team Showdown, and I think over time it's going to be a line that people find a lot of really broken things you can do with. Well, I think the break is also, I mean, you can move any, and a lot of decks I think appreciate having just energy mobility like that, you know. Definitely. Especially on like a, you know, a unique attacker too. You can pair it with any of the different ones and get something out of it. Like even the one that attacks for free, like you can play that in any deck. Yeah, and 140 HP is really scary, especially on a single mm. prizer. It doesn't have any attacks, which, you know, kind of balances it out. But um, that has, you know, potential, like I said, with Kingdra, you know, Rough Seas, Manaphy. It can just be, mm -hmm. you know, a nice attacker that you can kind of sit on for a turn if you're playing it in addition to other stuff. So you can, you know, buy a turn, hit with your Golduck Break, and then you can move the energy off and get out of the active. And you you basically just bought a turn for free that way uh, if you're, you know, playing it alongside something else. So a lot of interesting things you can do with it. Fair enough. Uh, now, the next line we're going to talk about, far more common, I've seen it in a lot of cubes, is Ampharos <laughs> Lightning. Yeah, I would, I would probably say this is the most popular line in the cube, not as far as play statistics, but as far as uh, commonality in other cubes. I mean, Ampharos is by far, I would say, one of the most power or popular Lightning lines, if not the most popular Lightning line across pretty much every cube that is not Mutant. But uh, it, it has a lot of cool stuff, and the reason why I put it in this cube is I actually think that um, people have gotten into this headspace where they think the line is weak, so I wanted to put it in a cube where I know it could be really powerful, and uh, and it has had good results since putting it in the cube for sure. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, I really love challenging the accepted notion of like what cards are strong and what cards are weak in cube. It's, it's one of my mm -hmm. favorite things to do both as a player and as a cube builder. And I thought that Ampharos in this space would have a lot of potential to be a very strong deck, but it could be a card that people kind of underrated or thought was weak. So I, I took on the challenge. <laughs> of, why do you why do you think that is? Why do you think people think that Ampharos isn't that good? It's got heavy attack costs and no real way to facilitate them. That's that's mm -hmm. the big thing. I see. Pretty much all the Ampharos is attack for three energy. Uh, the only exception is the one from Platinum, which attacks for two or three energy. Um at least in this cube so generally they're they're kind of heavy kind of slow they give you very incremental advantages and i do think a lot of cubes don't really give them the power to succeed as well uh you have to play a couple of ampharoses that really make the line worth running i would say mm -hmm. as opposed to just jamming four ampharos into a cube that seem that like they would work together um uh, Right. So then how do how do you try to answer this then? Like what are, what are you doing with Ampharos and uh make it work? So Ampharos in my cube has a, a couple of different things that, that can really make it powerful. Um for starters, 
it has the Damage Bind Ampharos from Platinum, which has the Pokebody named Damage Bind. <laughs> it <laughs> shuts off any Poke Powers on any Pokemon that has damage on it. And that synergizes incredibly well with the other Ampharoses in the line. Uh, it also has two fine attacks. It's it's pretty solid. Single prize attacker. You have Ampharos EX, which has conductivity as a Pokebody. Anytime your opponent attaches an energy to one of their Pokemon, it takes 10 damage. And then an attack, uh, Lightning Colorless Colorless for 40. If heads, you, uh, you flip a coin. If heads, it deals 70. If tails, they're paralyzed. So win-win either way. Right. Uh, you have Ampharos Prime, which also has conductivity, and this cube does have a rule that allows them to stack. Uh, so you can play both, and then your opponent takes 20 damage every energy they attach. That's already starting to amount to a fairly significant amount, especially in this cube, where the highest HP you're going to find on pretty much any Pokemon is like 140, 150. Uh, and then it has Lightning Crush, which is a very similar attack to uh, Ampharos EX. Uh, lightning colorless colorless 40 flip a coin if heads it deals 80 and if tails discard an energy attached to the defending pokemon so not an amazing attack as far as being above right or anything but it's it's fine and then i also play the ampharos from i believe that's secret wonders it has jamming whenever your opponent plays a supporter their entire board takes 10 damage so you can kind of see how all of these synergies add up. You know, jamming deals 10 damage to their whole board. Damage bind shuts it off. You also have incremental damage from conductivity. So you get a bunch of free damage. And uh, I think Ampharos is a line that really wants a partner. It, it's kind of hard to play it on right. its own. But there are a couple of partners that you can play with it to make it really strong. You can play like Victini from, I think, Unified Minds or Victini EX. There's a, there's a Victini for one energy, searches your deck for two energy of different types and attaches them to your bench. Victini EX is a two prizer, has a similar attack, but uh, you can attach two of the same kinds of energy. Uh, you can play it with Shadow Charge Weavile. I, I call it Shadow Charge, it might be like Dark Charge or something, but it's uh, zero energy, search your deck for two dark energy and attach them. This cube does allow you to play four special dark energy for free, so you can buff Ampharos's damage that way and accelerate, which is a really neat synergy. People use that in the like Diamond and Pearl era, especially with Gardevoir and Gallade. Um, so you can play it with Weavile. You can also take a more uh, cumulative damage kind of angle or, or even spread angle with, you can play with some of the spread tools. You can play Gengar level X. Um, which we'll get to later, there's a Gengar with Gnawing Curse, which makes your opponent's Pokemon take 20 damage whenever they attach an energy. Synergize is great with Conductivity. And then there is Electivire Level X in the cube, which we also will talk about in a little bit, with a Body Shocking Tail. When it's active, whenever your opponent attaches an energy, they take 20 damage. So you see, you get lots of different advantages that you can leverage with Ampharos, and it does a lot of broken things. Uh, powers are super, super strong in this cube. And the ability to just shut your opponent's powers off can be deciding. It can decide a game uh, without fail. So the number of decks that are going to be really crippled by that power lock is going to be significant. And it's very rare for a deck to be able to just get through a game without playing any supporters, you know. So most right. of the time, you're going to be able to shut them off. Yeah, Damage Mine is a card I'm surprised I don't see more people play when they play, like, if Ampharos is in the cube. So I feel like that just, in general, is a really strong team. Because, like, Poker Powers oftentimes are in a lot of different cubes. Like, I mean, if you have Claydol, if you have Delcaddy, those are popular draw lines. I'm surprised, like, if people are playing Ampharos, like, I don't commonly run into da Damage Mine. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, for sure. Um, I, I think Damage Bind is one of the things that can really make Ampharos a powerful line in a cube. I was talking about earlier, you know, you got to play the right Ampharoses to make it good. And I think Damage Bind right. is, if there is any one Ampharos that is that Ampharos, it's got to be Damage Bind. For sure. And then your your Lightning Stage 1 actually, you know, plays really well off Magmortar. You have Electrovire, kind of the, uh, the counterpart, the duo to uh, Magmortar. Yes, definitely. And Electivire, you know, like a lot of the other lines, like Magmortar itself, has tons and tons of different partners. <laughs> Uh, the kind of the feature piece of the line is Electivire Level X. A uh, really cool card. Did not see a lot of competitive play. A lot of people don't know about it, I think. Uh, it's from Mysterious Treasures, I think, DP2. Uh, Pokebody Shocking Tail. We've already talked about it. Whenever Electivire Level X is active and your opponent attaches from hand, their Pokemon takes 20 damage. Very strong against pretty much every deck because not a lot of decks, especially in this cube, get by without energy. 
And then uh, the attack is really interesting. It's Lightning Colorless Pulse Barrier for 50. You discard all of your opponent's tools and stadiums in play, and if you do, you prevent all effects, including damage done to Electivire during your opponent's next turn. So you buy yourself a turn, and you get your opponent's tools and stadiums out of play. So against certain strategies, this can be really strong, and it's always a really skillful attack because you have to decide exactly when the right time to Pulse Barrier is. When will you get the best advantage from that? And uh, when do you think your opponent will have a way to get out of it? Maybe like an escape rope or a counter catcher or something like that. So it, it, I think that it's a very skillful attack and it's one of my favorite attacks in cube uh, in general. So really neat. And it's also not something that you can just kind of sit on and like pulse barrier, pulse barrier, pulse barrier, because like, you know, 50 right. for two damage or 50 for two energy on like a stage one level X. It's not, <laughs> not a great rate if you're not doing anything else. So. Yeah, I actually didn't realize that's what that card did. Um, that's kind of cool, actually. There's a lot of skillful play definitely you can make with that. Um, decide it when you want to pull the trigger. It can probably come up with some clutch moments, too. Like, maybe in, like, a, you know... And, and you're putting down the low, falls buried for 50. And maybe you set up, like, a knockout in the next turn. Like, I could see that being pretty devastating at the right time. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of different things that you can do with Electivire. So, it kind of plays into all of them. Uh, as far as... Smaller Electivires, we have the Electivire with uh, two colorless for 30, and then Lightning Lightning colorless for 90. Uh, we have the Tag Team Spark Electivire, which is Lightning <laughs> for 20 plus 20 for each energy attached to your Mac Mortar, which are in this cube as well. So you can play Electivire with Mag Mortar, and Electivire can be a really powerful single prize, single energy attacker if you have the right acceleration for Mag Mortar. You know, if you kind of play in that big energy Mag Mortar deck, Electivire can be a really nice tech because it hits the waterline for weakness and it also can deal a lot of damage just on its own. And for one energy too. I think that's what probably makes it one of the coolest things is that it's one energy attack. Right, uh, essentially. right. So it really rewards you for building that deck in, in the right way. Uh, and then you have the Motor Drive Electivire, which is from Secret Wonders. Uh, you can each turn search your discard for a lightning and attach it to that Electivire. So if you have a way to move that energy off, like Shaman Unleashed or Mewtwo Delta or uh, Gold, Gold Luck Break, another card that we've talked about already that works amazingly with Electivire, there are tons and tons of ways to make that energy not just energy on that Electivire, you know, kind of energy at rest there, energy in play that you can put on something really scary. Uh, you can use the Rayquaza EX with um, Dragon Spiral that you can bench and then immediately move all the energy to. So, so many different ways that you can make this Electivire do really scary stuff. Uh, it's, again, one of my favorite cube cards, the Motor Drive one, just because it's such an interesting card in the sense that when you look at it, you're like, you know, this seems pretty good, but like, it, it's not amazing. But then when you find the number of cards that can enable it, or if you find the right card to enable it, then then it really becomes something cool. And then the yeah, last- Yeah, I always like Motor Drive. I think Motor Drive is like a really like fun card to play just because it's kind of like, like Malamar, but also an attacker. <laughs> exactly, yeah, and, and it is, but it takes a little bit more work to accelerate than right. Collectivire, which, or than, uh, than Malamar, which I really like. Yeah, it's pretty rewarding. You can make it work. Definitely. And then the last Collectivire kind of plays into the spread synergies more. Uh, and it can also result in some really scary starts. I think Electivire probably has more scary starts than any other line in the cube if you build right or if you draw well. Uh, it has a Lightning Colorless Colorless Electrowave, which deals 30 damage to each of your opponent's bench Pokemon, and then uh, Lightning in 3 Colorless, Shockwave for 80, not affected by resistance. So the second attack is fine. You know, 4 for 80, no drawback on a stage 1 is not great, but it's not horrible. But the first attack, Electrowave, Let's say you go turn one lightning energy, turn two DCE. Let's say you go turn one um, energy draw, which is the attack on one of the Electabuzzes, search your deck for basic energy attach, and then you get a third energy on turn two. You can get an Electrowave off that way. There are just a bunch of different ways in the cube. I say a bunch, not, not a ton of different ways, but there are enough ways to get a turn two Electrowave off that you can kind of try to build your deck around it or include that as you know, a really powerful option for your deck and uh, you can run with that. So that is, that rounds out the Electivire line and uh, overall just a line that I'm a big fan of. I really enjoy. Yeah, solid. And then I guess when I bring to like the other side of things, like fighting line, um, and even another line, I don't think I've ever seen it in queue before and that's Kabutops. 
definitely. So Kabutops is a line that I've also never seen played in cube before, and it's a strategy that I've never seen fighting use, which is a lock strategy. Uh, so each Kabutops, so one of the Kabutops is just an efficient attacker, but each of the other three prevents your opponent from playing a certain kind of card. So we have the Kabutops from Sun and Moon 9 with Fossilized Memories, prevents your opponent from playing supporters while it's in the active. It's a two-prizer. Uh, you have the Primal Shell Kabutops from, I think that's Majestic Dawn Stormfront, something like that, uh, where your opponent can't play trainers while it's in the active. You have the Kabutops from, it is uh, one of the later Gen 3 sets uh, with Primal Stare. Uh, when it's your active, your opponent can't play any basic Pokemon or evolution from their hand to evolve their active. Um, and then the last one is just a nice, efficient attacker. It is the Kabutops from Arceus. And it uh, has fighting for 20, and then if you discard a fossil from your hand, any fossil, it deals 70, and then uh, 3 for 60 and snipe uh, 10 on two Pokemon. So really interesting line. Um, and another line that can be really, really scary if you get up quickly. So your your goal is to kind of lock your opponent as fast as you can. And, and the flaws with Kabutops is that there's no great way to get a lot of energy on your Kabutops without attacking. Uh, because you want your deck to be so focused around getting out fast Kabutops. So the right. downside is you can definitely stumble. And you got to be ready for that. Um, and and a lot of the time your opponent your opponents are going to find breaks in your in your lock coverage which are going to allow them to play their own strategy and, and make it an interesting game. So um, I, I really like the Kabutops line. It's interesting because a lot of people, including myself, when they look at this cube, they think, "Wow, the Kabutops line seems crazy." But it has never actually. It is one of the only lines in the cube that has not done well. Get like a first or second place. Um, so it's. Uh, I don't know. I, I keep it in here because I definitely, like, it, it can win. I'm absolutely confident that it can. But um, I do find it interesting that out of all of the lines, it looks the most broken and has the poorest results. All right, hot take. Ready? Oh, yeah, I'm ready. The Boot Ops is going to win the Champions Cube. We we will see. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, you know, the... Place all your bets on Kaboot Ops. Oh, it's, it's time to come. Will will it be Kabutops' day to shine, or will it oh, yeah. once again fail to impress? That's the question. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about your uh, your fighting stage one line. You got Lucario with two copies of Lucario level X. Yes, so Lucario is uh, another line not super rare to see, but one that I really love, especially the level X with stance. I love that damage block for a turn. I think it's really cool. Another really skillful card. You have to decide, you know, when it's best to stance. And um, probably not quite as much as Pulse Barrier because, you know, blocking an attack whenever you want, it's going to be good no matter when you can do it. But uh, Right, right, right. You know, <laughs> using stance on a critical turn is, is game winning. And uh, Right, yeah, exactly. It, it, a lot of the time it can be game ending. So a lot of the Lucarios just have, you know, really nice efficient attacks. We have Lucario fighting for 40, fighting colorless, colorless for 70. We have Lucario colorless for 30, uh, bulk up. Each of your Lucario's attacks does 30 more damage next turn, and then two fighting for 50. Uh, we have probably the most powerful Lucario in the cube, which is the one with Precognitive Aura. There are no Garchomps in the cube, so you can't use that. But uh, Missile Jab, <laughs> fighting colorless for 70, not affected by resistance, is the most powerful, cheap attack with no cost on a stage one in the cube. And then uh, we have the Lucario from... I think this one is Stormfront, <laughs> um, with Focus Blast, Spike Lariat, uh, so you can do 30 Snipe if you, you know, miss a kill. Lucario is often not swinging for one shot, so you're swinging for two shots most of the time, which is, you know, you, you got to figure out how to use Stance the highest number of possible times in the game um, to really push that advantage. So you use Focus Blast, you can, you know, pick off a prize that you barely missed earlier in the game. And then you have Spike Lariat, which is Fighting, Fighting, Colorless, 60, and then 20 more damage if uh, if you or if your opponent's active has damage on it already. So it can just be a nice way to deal 80 for 3, which Lucario pretty much tops out at. 
solid. I, I, I like, I like that there's, um, I like that there's extra snipe built into it because like you said, the car is going to be missing knockouts periodically. So having a way to clean up that damage is really strong as well. Definitely. Yeah. Just kind of... in conjunction with stance too. So it's like you could stance into like a knockout and then, um, be able to maybe set up another knockout after that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and kind of Lucario's play is trying to go really aggressive and then start stancing as much as possible and slowing your opponent down, keeping them from leveraging some of those super powerful late game combos that a lot of decks use, and uh, and it's really interesting. And and there are ways to get around stance, of course. You know, cards we've talked about before: escape rope, countercatcher. But you know, the the conditions that you see on cards like Skun Tank G on cards like Poisonous Nest Ariados, those do get around stance, so it's not a completely safe thing. So you you do have to oh, think about okay. it more, especially against some decks than others. So does stance not work then once you uh, like poison it? So Well, stance does, but it's oh, not an effective okay. an attack if you poison it with a power or an ability. Or, well, it'd be a power either way in this cube, but... Um, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so you can that makes more sense. get yeah. around the attack block that way. Aha, uh -huh. okay. But and I do appreciate, you know, a deck that rewards, like, you know, timing. Yeah, yeah, and that's really what Lucario is about, kind of getting the stances off at the right time and uh, figuring out the way that you can reuse them the best. For sure. So let's move on to Psychic. Uh, and another very popular Pokemon, you have Gengar as your Psychic Stage 2. I do, I do. Gengar, again, pretty popular Pokemon. Um, I would say slightly less popular than Ampharos, just because there are more good Psychic Pokemon to include in all power levels of Cube. But uh, as far as actual popularity as a Pokemon, definitely higher than Ampharos. But uh, moving right. into its kind of strategies. So Gengar is this... It has, again, kind of two modes. It has this hit-and-run mode with uh, two of the Cursed Gengars, and there are a fair few Pokemon in the cube that are kind of nice to get back into. Uh, you have Spiritomb from Arceus. You have Aerial, Mr. Mime. Um, you have a lot of free-retreating SP Pokemon that are kind of nice just because they're spongy. <laughs> you can you can pick them up pretty easily with Poketurn. Um, some of them, like Gallade 4 Level X, you're really happy to get back into. Let it soak 60 damage level it up, deal 10 damage to your opponent's entire board, and then Poke Turn and pick it back up. So you can kind of rinse and repeat in that way. Um, it's it's not a deck where you can, like, you know, permanently item lock your opponent out of the game like the deck would do in, in the, the Diamond and Pearl era, but uh, the hit and run strategy is very powerful. You know, just being able to swing 60, snipe 10 every turn, and then move that damage with Curse. Um, it, it's, it's an advantage that adds up. So uh, you do have one of the Gengar level X, which it's not as defining in this line, so that's why it's only one of, and it's also stage two level X, which there are very few of in the cube. Uh, Poke Power level down, actually extremely powerful in this cube because there are so, so many level Xs. Uh, very, very often you are going to be able to remove a level X from your opponent's board. And then um, Psychic, Psychic, Colorless, Compound Pain deals 30 damage to each of your opponent's Pokemon with damage on it. Very easy to set Compound Pain up to do really scary stuff, so... Uh, you always kind of have to have to be cautious of that. Uh, you have two of the Gengar from Arceus with Curse and Shadow Skip, which we've already talked about. That's kind of your hit and run side. And then you have more of your spread side, which is the Gengars from Stormfront and uh, one of the earlier Sun and Moon sets, the one with Gnawing Curse and Psychic Colorless, Colorless, Fade to Black, 70 damage. Your opponent's active is confused. Um, and then the Stormfront Gengar talked about that very briefly. Um, Poke Power Fainting Spell. Your opponent knocks it out. You flip a coin. If you get heads, they're knocked out too. There are a lot of ways in this cube to get around Fainting Spell. Um, there are a lot of conditions. There are powers like Crobat G, Gallade 4. Um, Fainting Spell is not an absolute in this cube by any means, but it is very powerful. So uh, I, I like it just because it is circumventable by a lot of decks. Uh, you have Shadow Room, which is a really great snipe attack, and then Poltergeist, which can be a very powerful attack in the right situation, can deal lots of damage if your opponent has lots of trainers in hand. So Gengar is pretty self-contained, but it also has lots of different partners that you can play it with. So another line that kind of plays into that synergy or that that ideology in this cube. Right, for sure. And then as for stage one, you also have uh, Banet, which is another pretty popular one I've seen. For sure, yeah. So, uh, Bayonet, this cube has a lot of decks that want cards in the discard. So, I actually have two of the Temper Tantrum Bayonet um, in this cube, which is the one from Platinum. 
essentially during your turn you can discard as many cards as you like from your hand and if you do you put that many damage counters on Vayna. So there are some decks like Kingdra, like Electivire, uh, there, there are quite a few decks that are happy to have certain things in the discard. So Bayonet can play into that. In addition, it's got pretty energy efficient attacks. Uh, Darkness Switch, one psychic energy, discard an energy attached to Bayonet and switch the damage counters from Bayonet uh, and the active Poke or in the defending Pokemon. So, um, you know, really easy way to deal 70, 80 damage for one energy there, but you gotta, you gotta build it up first. Um, it's other attack, Loneliness, two for 30. If you don't have any Pokemon in your hand, deals two for 60, really solid rate. Then we have the Bayonet with Red Eyes. Uh, when you evolve it, you can put a basic from your opponent's discard onto their bench, and then Psychic Colorless Enemy Show for each of your opponent's Pokemon in play. You can put a damage counter anywhere you like. Really strong spread. And then the Bayonet EX, uh, infamous from the Ruby Sapphire era. Shady Move, you can move damage from anywhere to anywhere if it's active once per turn. And Shadow Chant Potential 2 for 90. Uh, Bayonet EX definitely earns its EX tag in this cube. So uh, Bayonet, again, not a deck you're really going to play on its own, but it, it provides phenomenal support both aggressively and kind of synergistically for a lot of different decks. Yeah, and I think one thing also I appreciate is that both of your psychic types are weak to dark, not necessarily weak to psychic, which I think is sometimes uh, a problem when you're trying to think about balance. Yeah, it makes it so that the best answer to psychic is not psychic, you know? Right. So I, I like that about it. And then I guess we should move on to the uh, that type, uh, dark. So you're, um, you don't have a dark stage, too, uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, yeah. So... So I got a little bit weird with Dark. Um, I didn't want to play Tyranitar because sure. it's very, very popular and it's been done to death. And I didn't think that there was anything that I could add to the conversation on Tyranitar. And I, I didn't like it enough to put it in this anyway. Sure, that's fair. So uh, then uh, so then you actually opted for two stage ones. Yes, so I have, I have two stage one lines as compensation. Dark also has some really cool support in the trainer and energy section. You can play four special Dark in a deck just for free. In addition to any that you draft, there are two more in the draft, so you could have a potential of six in your deck. Um, and uh, you also have four Dark Patch in the cube to speed Dark up, and you have uh, a Dark Claw, which is the highest damage buff in the cube for uh, for any Pokemon. So, so a lot of different things you can take advantage of there. Yeah, so I was going to say, so let's start your first dark stage one is uh, Mighty Anna, which, uh, and again, another one I honestly don't ever see pop up in cube. It, it is a little bit rare. I think it's becoming a little bit less rare in the low power side, especially, but I really wanted ah, to make okay. Mighty Anna a mid power guy, and I've never seen it in a mid power cube before. So I have not either. Uh, but a card that I think didn't get a lot of love when it came out, and for, for solid reason, but unfortunately is mighty enna from platinum it has a body cold feet if it has a special condition on it then its attacks are free and wow. <laughs> its first attack is 20 plus 20 if you played supporter this turn for two and it's a second attack is dark dark colorless for 50 if you have less energy attached than the defending pokemon you deal 80 instead so very easy to get like a just a ripping fast turn to 80 with mighty enna for zero energy if you play cards like Skuntank G or Ariados with Poisonous Nest to intentionally poison yourself. So there are three different poison enablers in the cube that you can get with Mighty Anna. Most of the time, if you're keeping an eye out for it, you will get that poison enabler without too much issue. And then you have the most aggressive attacker in the cube. I mean, you you can't do any better than 80 for two, or for 80, 80 for, for zero yeah. on turn Which two. Is insane. Actually, probably 90 if you're thinking about like the Ariados. Yeah, from poisoned. the poison damage. So that's that seems really good, and it has free retreat as well as some psychic resistance. So it's you know, it's a really cool card. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, and then its partners are the Mighty Anna from Legends Awakened with uh Bite On. It's dark for thirty. If the defending Pokemon is not evolved, then it can't attack, retreat, or use any Poke powers. There are a lot of powerful basic Pokemon in this cube, especially in the SP archetype that we'll get to a little bit later. Tons of SP level X's that people are going to be playing in all kinds of different decks. Bite on gets a lot of value there. And then uh, just a nice colorless, colorless harass, 10 times the number of Pokemon you have in play. So really easy, 60 for two, no cost. If you have special darks, you can get up to you know 80 for two, no problem. 
Just a, a nice above rate attack. And then Mighty Anna EX, interesting card. I've actually removed the EX tag in this cube. So it is the only card in this cube that says it's an EX, but it's actually not. And that's because Mighty Anna EX is just not any more powerful than a lot of the stage ones in the cube. But I love Makes it, sense. And, I, and I wanted to use it. Uh, so a Pokemon power, or a Poke power that is very, very powerful in this cube, especially with like the stance effects and the conditions and, and all of that is Driving Howl. Essentially, it is a one-sided escape rope for your opponent or it's a repel. You can force them to switch every turn. Uh, Mighty Anna can be anywhere. It doesn't even have to be active for that. Uh, and then your attacks are Sharp Fang, 2 for 30. Nothing to write home about. But your second attack is Dark Colorless, Colorless, 50. And if their active is a stage 2, it's 90. So especially with Special Dark Energy, really not that hard to push that attack up into like the 100 plus range, which is... As well as Dark Claw. Yeah, yeah. A very scary thing to be able to do and uh, a very difficult thing to answer for some decks. So Mighty Anna can definitely just be a deck on its own. And uh, it can be the most aggressive deck in the queue which is is scary <laughs> if you're especially I, if you're playing a slower deck i also love that like all of them have like well all but one have like free retreat too which is really cool yeah they're super mobile and even the one that doesn't have free retreat retreats for one so really easy to get yeah. in and out of the the right mighty nf for your situation and with them having situational attacks it is definitely not going to be cut and dry what attack you need for every situation so being able to get back between them is really nice yeah, so let's jump to the next uh, stage one, which is Honchcrow. Honchcrow is a favorite of mine. Um, it sees a little bit of play, especially with uh, the Honcho's Command Honchcrow, but that is actually one of my most hated strategies in cube. I hate the Honcho's Command Honchcrow, like Murkrow deck. I think it's so boring. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, for the listeners who don't know what it does, it essentially just says that uh, all of your Murkrows in play can attack with any of the attacks that that honchcrow has energy attached to it for uh it sounds complicated because it is but basically huh. it has an attack that's like three for 50 and it makes it so that all your murkrows in play can use that attack for free uh it's it's cool like, very played out it's unique but it's it's boring like it doesn't do anything interesting uh, yeah so this this is a different kind of honchcrow we have two honchcrow level x um, which is a level X that saw no competitive play and is probably one of the most forgettable level Xs ever, but I love it. Uh, two colorless for 40 damage anywhere, which is not affected by powers, bodies, effects, anything. Uh, so that actually does punch through stuff like stance, which is which is nice. And then uh, darkness wing, which is dark dark colorless for 60. Not a good rate, but if you take a knockout with the attack, you can get any one card from your discard back into your hand. So being able to clean up knockouts with Honchkrow level X can literally decide games because of how powerful the effect of that attack is. And then with special darks and dark claw, really easy to get that 60 damage up to something more respectable, like 70, 80, 90. Yeah, I actually did not realize Darkness Wing grabbed a card from the discard. I, that's really good. Especially when you have like resources like Dark Claw or any sort of damage buff. Really, any resource in general is probably going to be really strong with that attack. And you're taking a knockout. Right. And Dark is this really just, uh, you know, go as hard as fast as you can uh, kind of aggressive de er, archetype. Uh, both of the lines have that have that angle. Honchkrow is a little bit more controlling. Mighty N is a little bit more like just, you know, really get out there. Um, right. <laughs> but they both have that. And being able to clean up knockouts that you kind of set up and get stuff back for it is so good. Um, yeah, so let's get into the actual line itself. So you have the one from uh, Guardians Rising? Yeah, yeah. So I have the Guardians Rising one, uh, Faint Attack, Dark for 30, ignores all effects, can get through, you know, lots of really annoying stuff. Uh, and then you have Raven's Claw, Colorless, Colorless, 10 damage, plus 10 more for each damage counter on all of your opponent's Pokemon. This card is not a card that you're going to play in your Hunch Codex very often, although you can. Uh, it's a card that you're going to play in your spread decks, which Honchkrow can do, if, especially with the right partners. So um, Raven's Claw, especially if you set it up with some spread damage first, is is going to really get some some ridiculous damage uh, for, for not a lot of energy. But, you know, takes a lot, takes some careful play. And two energy, not always the easiest to do, especially if you're primarily attacking with something else. 
Um, you have the Darkness Restore one from Supreme Victors. You can put a basic on your opponent's bench from their discard. And then it has Riot, which is one of the most powerful attacks on a stage one in the cube. Dark, colorless, colorless, 30 damage plus 10 for each Pokemon that isn't an evolved po that isn't an evolved Pokemon in play. So you max out at like 140, which is unlikely. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But a lot of the time, it, you 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 know you hit 90, 100 without too much issue. So uh, very very powerful attacker there. You have Honchkrow with Hypnoblast, one for 20. Uh, put your opponent's active to sleep. Nightmare Mambo, Dark Colorless, Colorless, 60. And then if they're asleep, then it deals 60 more. So kind of kind of synergizes with itself. And um, previously, there were ways in the cube to inflict sleep without using attacks or anything. I, I've limited that because it was a little bit too good. But there are still ways. Um, and the last one is a really neat one if you are using a lot of dark Pokemon, just playing like a super heavy dark deck. It is the one from uh, Undaunted with vengeance which is dark color was colorless 10 plus 10 damage for each dark pokemon in your discard so you can you can see how that would get pushed up pretty fast yeah yeah i think uh the thing with honchkrow too that's kind of cool is that you can play it it's kind of like the other lines uh, we talked about that were just they, they synergize in more than just one specific deck like uh, like you said, the uh, the Raven's Claw Honchkrow can find its way in it. Like mostly spread decks, like it's probably even better off in those decks than actually a straight Honchkrow deck. Which I think is even more interesting. This just allows for more lines to play, and like you can cover, especially if you're thinking like some sort of spread deck with like maybe Vanette and Gengar. You can cover, you know, you can have a dark type in there to like deal with those kind of cards. Yeah, definitely. So it's splashable in a lot of stuff that would want a dark type Pokemon that is resistant to fighting. Yeah. Um. Anything else about dark? I, I see you had um. You have like I guess you have you, you used to have dark red level X, but then you decided to take that out. I used to have dark red level X, yeah, and it was powerful, but not too powerful. The thing that I didn't like about it is that it essentially, with its attack, uh, endless darkness, three. It's essentially three for seventy if you have three dark energy because of its body. But um, what it does is your opponent falls asleep. And then they flip two coins for sleep in between turns instead of one. And if either is tails, then they're still asleep. And if both are tails, then they're knocked out. And ah, yeah. I love Dark Eye Level X and Cube. But what would happen in Dark decks is that people would just slam energy on Dark Eye Level X. And they would swing with Dark Eye Level X. And games essentially came down to, do I sack my opponent and get heads and wake up immediately? Or do I get sacked by my opponent and lose the game on the spot by flipping double tails on sleep? Or do I not get to play the game and, and stay asleep? So um, there was no no outcome of the three made both players enjoy the game. And that's why, yeah. that's why I took it out. And, and then after I took it out, I added in the dark patches. I added in the special darks for free because I wanted darks to be able to have that aggressive presence that they had before, but I wanted it to be more fun, <laughs> essentially. Oh, that's fair. Um, okay. And then I guess that brings us almost to the last, like, I guess, full outline. That's Porygon 2. Yeah, uh, so um, I can just run through the support line super fast. We have Porygon 2 as a support line. We have Delcaddy as a support line. We have Clayall as a support line. All of them support different archetypes. They, in some cases, draw you cards. They fix your energy. They get your stadiums back. Um, lots of, you know, kind of supporting activities. Um, you have Reggie Gigas Level X, which is an archetype on its own, or it's a powerful tech attacker in a deck that can afford to either move or accelerate the energy. Think like Golduck, Kingdra, uh, anything like that. You have, and, and then you have SP. And I would say SP is the last like big archetype in the cube. I have a rule where if you draft, so there are no basic SP Pokemon that level up in the cube. They're only their level Xs. And the rule is when you draft an SP level X, you get two of the basics. And SP, I see. SP Pokemon are always very contested. You are not getting them for free. You are never going to have a totally open SP draft. It's just not going to happen because they're so techable. But you can make an SP deck pretty reliably. There are at least two of all the Team Galactic's inventions in the cube. So you can really put it together and, and do something cool. So um, just a quick run through of all the SP Pokemon. Charizard G, Star After FB, two Garchomp C, uh, Blaziken FB, Absol G, Luxray GL, two Gallade 4, a Floatzel, 
uh, pa two Palkia G, Dialga G, and Infernape 4. All of those have level X's in the cube and uh, and can be played. So, lots to do there. So then for like uh, Oopsie level X, you don't necessarily get two, right? Right. No, SP. So, You're talking about SPs. Yeah, yeah, so it's only the SP level X's that follow that rule. Uh, all the other basic level X's have at least two of the basic and a lot of the time three. So you, you have lots of opportunities to get your basic there. Oh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, one thing I did want to like touch on that I think is really kind of also unique is you have a, um, like a, a small Alakazam line with power cancel. Yeah, so... Uh, he he's on the verge of being taken out. I will say, just because people are not uh -huh. not using it, but um, I think it has potential still, and I, I want to let it ride for at least the champions cube, and then after that, we'll we'll see where it falls. But um, essentially, what power cancel does is uh, during your opponent's turn, when your opponent uses a poke power, you can discard two cards from your hand and prevent the effects of that, and and. Uh, that counts as them using the power so they don't get to use it again and uh, it's just a really powerful disruptive effect I mean it's one of the few effects that actually interacts in your opponent's turn yeah it is and and I really wanted to see if that could be played in cube I still think it can it has not yet I'm starting to lose faith but I haven't completely <laughs> so all right so so what I'm hearing is Kabutov's Alakazam is winning champions <laughs> oh yeah absolutely <laughs> Um, I guess there is there are two support lines that I missed. I'll just touch on very briefly. I have a four four sure. electrode line. Um, all of them explode and get you energy in play, except for the dark electrode that attaches dark or dark metal from the discard to electrode. Um, that can be used in dark decks with um, with like celebration wind shaman or. That one's a little bit more narrow, for sure. You could use it with Golduck Break. Um, Golduck Break definitely makes for a very good dark partner, so definitely not a bad idea. Uh, and then the uh, Shadow Charge Weavile, which gets dark energy out of your deck and can also turn your Pokemon into dark types. So you can search for those special darks, you can turn your Pokemon into dark types, and you can get damage bonuses on lines that normally would not benefit from those. Solid. Um, yeah, I mean, like, so we've kind of just gone through the whole cube right so a lot a lot of a uh, lot of different strategies that's just the pokemon <laughs> it, i mean you also having the supporters and i mean the trainers that make it the cube are you know obviously important but the pokemon are kind of the bread and butter when you say definitely yeah so i mean with that and you know this is going to be drafted and uh on the 6th of uh, february champions cube there's probably a few potential lines that are going to look really strong one that stands out to me in particular is that Ariados line, uh, not only because there's a lot of consistency in the attacker, but I think that strategy is very splashable, very efficient to uh, pull off. You have partners like uh, Victory Bell that uh, can tango really well with it. And then, of course, you also have like the Magmortar that burns. You have multiple outs for poison. Uh, I could see that being a very popular pick. Uh, Connor, what lines stand out for you for being like maybe strong for this tournament? So, uh, so my, my standout pick that I expect to do well um, and would be pretty surprised if it didn't do well, is spread. Whether that be in the Gengar, uh, Chandelure, Azelf, Honchkrow, Gallade 4 level X, Bayonet, Cresselia level X, which is in here we didn't really talk about, um, Ampharos, Electivire, there are so, so many different ways to spread damage in this cube, and some of the most powerful above-rate attacks come in the form of spread attacks. Because, you know, that's that's how you make spread worth it you know if your attacks have more damage than your opponents but you know they're spread out in different places then those attacks are balanced it's just that um you get value in different ways so um the, there's an azel psychic uh, psychic for 20 damage to all of your opponent's pokemon that have damage on it which very easy to knock out it's got like 60 70 hp but that's that's a huge amount of damage to deal with one attack so so many different ways you can take advantage of that spread, and uh, I'd be really surprised to not see that do well. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see how people draft that too. Um, I think spread can like you know manifest its way into lots of different types. So um, yeah, really curious to see uh, what comes about. Yeah, I I will be curious. I have expectations, but you know, as a cube builder, I feel like you are always having your expectations subverted. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the truth. Like, you definitely, uh, you, you, you think you've seen everything in your cube, and then someone always kind of comes out of the woodwork for something different. For sure. 
So, I mean, kind of with that same thought, um, probably probably some archetypes that um, maybe, like, you know, kind of sleeper picks. Uh, for me, I like, I really like the Mighty Anna line uh, we talked about earlier. I like it because it's, you know, such a fast and, like, efficient attacker. And if you can draft it with the right pieces, I think you have a really strong, like, pick on your hands. Yeah, I definitely agree. And Mighty Anna is one of the other two lines that has not been successful next to Kabu Tops. And part of that, I think, is because Mighty Anna EX was an EX for a long time. That kind of uh, pushed people away. But I also think people haven't really explored it that much. Um, it's it's interesting. It's not glorious in the same way that some other lines are, where, you know, you you are actively making your Pokemon die <laughs> by poisoning sure. it. But then you get the fastest damage in the cube. So... Um, I think a lot of it is untapped potential, and some of it is just that it needed a buff, and now it's got a buff. So I agree with you completely. Yes, then what are you looking at, then, as maybe a potential sleeper pick? My sleeper pick is Golduck. Um, it has so many different archetypes and so many different ways you can play it, and people have just kind of started to explore it, and they we've seen a lot of potential coming from that line. You can play it with... AMU, which is, uh, is another thing in this cube that we, we didn't talk about that much, but um, you can deal... AMU, the Pixie level Xs, deals uh, two for 200 damage, which normally the, the problems with AMU are that hard to get it at, or hard to get them in and into and out of the active because you have to have all three level Xs in play. That is still true. Um, but very easy to accelerate those energy with Golduck because, you know, you can just have a, a few turns worth of attachments or Victini acceleration or whatever, and then you can kind of move them up as you need them. So very easy to loop the attacks with Golduck, uh, easier than any other archetype. Um, you can play Regigigas level X, you know, take advantage of some of the cards that are powerful if you have no energy attached or can get your energy back in play really quickly, like, you know, the scoop up effects. Normally you're not really happy to scoop up a Gigas level X because you're committed to that like four energy attacker, but with Golduck, not a big deal. <laughs> you can just have another four energy attacker and be happy with that. Um, Palkia G level X can be an excellent Pokemon to play with Golduck just because you can move those energy up. You can get lots of cool snipe damage. You can go back into Golduck if you need a couple of turns to build up. Uh, plays a really nice uh, cadence there. You can use Shadow Charge Weavile, play a bunch of dark type Pokemon, be able to move those dark energy wherever you want. So just tons of different ways that people can use Golduck and we've started to see people do it and I think Champions Cube might be where we see somebody do it really well. Yeah, I mean let's hope so. I'm really excited to see uh if people are able to pick some stuff up with uh Golduck. Definitely. So then um I guess the last thing we want to look at is like maybe like the top tech card uh, for decks in your cube. My personal favorite and like something that I think is uh traditionally maybe undervalued in a sense is a weakness policy. Just because weakness can play a huge deal in a lot of matchups, and being able to just attach weakness policy as a tool uh, is fairly efficient and gives you a significant edge when you're, especially when you're being threatened by a knockout. Yeah, definitely. I I love weakness policy in cube in general, and I think people take it too low and they're too afraid to run it because you know it doesn't do it doesn't do something against every matchup. But it's so easy to get out of your hand and get out of your deck. You know, if you're playing a matchup where it's not useful, just throw it down. But so many cube decks play like two plus types. Or, or even like three, four, five. So it's it's not that rare for you to find a deck that's hitting you for weakness. Uh, my top tech, I would say, is Cresselia level X. It has a really nice power, allows you to move a damage counter from anywhere to anywhere every turn. And then its tech is really interesting. It's Psychic Psychic Colorless, which is a pretty expensive cost, for 40 damage. Terrible. <laughs> However, if you take a knockout with it, then you take two prizes. So in combination with a lot of the spread synergies, in combination with some of the aggressive decks, you can play with Golduck. <laughs> you can play everything with Golduck. Um, it is going to be really, or it's going to be a lot easier than people think to facilitate those, those two prize knockouts. So definitely going to be on the lookout for that one coming through. Yeah, I think that's actually a card I don't think I've ever seen played before with Cresselia level X. But that attack, I mean, like, it's a good cleanup card, too. I mean, just being able to keep you on tempo with the extra prize is really nice. Yeah, it's it's just there are a lot of ways you can use it. A lot of decks really like the effect, and uh, I, I'm really ready to see it come out and uh, be powerful. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, like, the last thing with Eckhart, too, is I like the ability to full moon dance. Just being able to move a damage counter around without it necessarily being the active. I think that's really strong. Definitely. And and the cost for that is having to have gotten the Cresselia into the active and then retreated the Cresselia afterward, um, which is a lot to do for a lot of decks. However, you get the payoff of essentially, you know, having free damage anytime you have damage on one of your Pokemon. Yeah, and I, th I think there, I think you definitely can find value with that. And the nice thing too is like the um, the Cresselia from a, I think Breakpoint has free retreat if there's a stadium in play. Yes, yeah. So a little bit of synergy there for sure. Um. So then I guess like you know that kind of rounds out the cube. And like I said, we're gonna be draft uh drafting cube's gonna be taking place on February the sixth. Is that correct? Yep. February sixth is the day of the draft. In day one of play, we will not finish it on the 6th. It'll probably be finished on the 13th or even after the 13th, depending on how many rounds we end up having. But uh, more info to come on that soon. And um, yeah, so so we will be streaming that as well. Or specifically, Andrew will be streaming that with some of the members of the Cube Discord. It should be very exciting. Sadly, we won't be able to stream the draft, per se. But, uh, you know, after seeing all these lines um, that we talked about, you will get to see them in action. Uh, around what time are we thinking? Uh, so I'm going to guess the stream will start about 12 or 1. Uh, we do actually allow bracket predictions for Champions Cube because it is a double elimination event, so you can make full bracket. Uh, the person who wins the bracket gets a roll and I believe an emote in the server. Don't quote me on that. I, I need to double check the rules first, but um, you at least get a special role in the server. It can be whatever you want as long as it's, you know, friendly um, and uh, it, it's just a good time. So stream will start with bracket predictions after everybody submitted their decks and then we will move right into round one of play. I'm excited, uh, especially as a spectator, to watch how all of these uh, uh, players, what they draft, what they build, you know, especially watching the games. I think cube games themselves are always, like, super impactful, really cool to watch. Lots of different strategies going on. Uh, it's a good time. I, I love watching cube. I, I feel like I watch cube like it's, you know, football or, or a sport or something like that. Um I, I just love watching Cube League matches, especially because they're they're pretty serious. They're best of three, um, really skillful. So yeah, if that sounds good, make sure you guys are tuning in February 6th, around 12 to 1 uh, Central Time, when we're going to be starting. Uh, be on the lookout. You can check the Cube Discord for more information uh, or Legend Box on Facebook. Uh, and Connor, any last thoughts before uh, you know, we close out the segment on uh, your Cube specifically? I, I think we've covered the Cube you know, very well front to back. Um, I'm just really excited to see what people make and I'm really excited to play in the event myself. You know, I, uh, I did not do so well in Champions Cube last time. I went in first seed and then I was out in like the third or fourth round. So I really feel like I, I've got to do something this time. Whereas last time I, I didn't feel that way as much. For sure. And you know what? Best of luck to you. I hope, I hope you have a good time. I hope, it, hope the draft goes well. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All right, well, that's going to do it for this segment. Now, stick around. We're going to be going to our conclusion segment in just a second. How's it going, guys? This is Connor with a friendly reminder about the upcoming Champions Cube. Starting on February 6th, Champions Cube is essentially the World Championships of Cube, featuring the best players from the Cube League season. For more information, be sure to stick around to the end of the next segment. All right, so welcome back to this uh, conclusion segment. Uh, if you aren't in the Facebook group, uh, the Legend Box, we do have a Q and A thread that uh, anyone is welcome to post in. You can get uh, your Q questions answered right away. And uh, one interesting question uh, that came up is uh, a person was talking about basically what happens uh, when you drafted your cube enough and it kind of gets stale, and how you um, like where do you go from there? And I thought that was a really interesting question, mostly because I've been there personally, and um, after drafting my own cube a bunch and my friend group, uh, at, at some point you do kind of get a little bit in a rut, and you kind of, you know, where you want to go from there it can be a little bit challenging. Uh, Connor, what do you think about, you know, these cube ruts that people find themselves in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's pretty natural for people to end up there, especially if you draft your own cube a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you... You've been everywhere, you've seen everything, and uh, and there's not much left in it that you haven't seen or tried before. So uh, there, we, we do have 
a fair few ways that uh, you can kind of go about freshening up your experience again. So um, we are excited to talk about it. Yeah, I think I think for me, um, one of the biggest things is I start feeling like uh, my cues getting stale, or I'm not happy with it, and I don't know where to go as far as like maybe I don't know what lines to switch out, or I don't quite know like what the design I'm going for. I find it's best just to take a break, and but that means don't touch your cue for a little bit, and especially right now as you know it's coronavirus, so it can't really meet up in person anyway. It's probably a little bit easier to do that, but also take some time and maybe draft other people's cube, maybe even play some different formats. Um, outside of standard to kind of get some more perspective on maybe eras of Pokemon that you like or strategies that you like. Just getting outside of your, your headspace to give you some fresh air per se, I think provides a lot of perspective and can make coming back to your cube a lot easier and, you know, kind of be a lot more enlightening once you've had all this other experience. Definitely, yeah. I would say, you know, <clears throat> if, if cube in general is just not fun for you, then, uh, then, then take a break. You know, don't don't force yourself to do something that's not fun. But um, if you still think cube is fun and you're just, you know, not really feeling your cube, you're looking for inspiration, maybe even just want to try something new. Uh, I would say my number one thing is play other people's cubes. Um, I built my cube in June of May or June of 2020, and uh, I've run it a fair few times now, but I have never felt like it was stale because I've played so many other people's cubes in between each run. Uh, you know, it's it's almost, you just, uh, you just come back to, you know, this totally fresh thing that you built because you wanted it to be different in some way or you wanted it to be better in some way. And you get to experience why you built that cube over again every time if you have that buffer of other people's cubes in between and a lot of the time too, when you play other people's cubes, you'll find things that you like, you'll find things that you don't like, and that's gonna allow you to make changes to your cube that's gonna make it even more fun. Yeah, I think that that's also a good point too, is uh, being able just to see what other people have been doing with their cubes gives you a lot more perspective uh, at the same time. Definitely, I mean, there's cube is such an expansive format and, and you are just one person at the end of the day, so you are never going to come up with or flesh out all of the ideas that there are to have with cube on your own. Um, so having a community there, experiencing what there is to experience or even, you know, parts of what there is to experience is going to be a hugely helpful thing for you. And I think the, um, the other thing too, that I forgot to mention that I also think is great. Um, if you, uh, maybe want to get a different uh, light on your cube is, Try just playing the observer, like have your friends run a draft and play your cube and just kind of sit and observe how people draft it. That's a really good way to figure out if maybe lines you put in there are, you know, being, you know, people are responding to what you have in the draft and like what people are, you know, uh, how are they reacting to your cube? I think it can be like almost like a focus study and it's really effective and it's really fun. It's a new, it's like a different take on, you know, being more of the cube designer as opposed to just the player. Definitely. Uh, so, I mean, any final thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so, other things that you can do, um, you can you can change out lines in your cube. Even if your cube is in a place of, of balance that you like, uh, if it's getting stale, then then make some changes. You know, sure, it's probably not going to be as balanced, at least starting out, as it was when you had it in that nice, pristine state. But uh, it it can make things fresh again. It can introduce new elements. Um, even existing decks can change based on what you add into the cube. You know, maybe some line has a really good partner now, or maybe one of the more powerful lines has a really strong adversary, uh, something that hits it for weakness. So any any experimentation that you can do is going to be helpful in freshening up your cube again. Although, you know, you, you might need more of a significant change than that to really feel fresh again. So for that, you could... Either, you know, do one of the things we've already talked about, or you could just build a fresh cube. Uh, a lot of people have built multiple cubes in their time. They have lots of resources. There are tons of different cubes that you can look at. You know, if there is something that you wanted to try out in your original cube, but the power level wasn't right, or there just wasn't space, then there are a lot of things that you can do as far as just making a new cube, starting fresh. You can either keep your old cube intact if you want to be able to hang on to that and go back to it, or you can just 
completely take it apart and start fresh. If you really just want a totally new experience and you feel like you have done all there was to do with your first cube. Yeah, I mean, lots of good stuff to take away from there. So I think that kind of rounds us out for, uh, you know, that the Q&A section. If you want to have any questions answered on the podcast, feel free to leave us a comment on YouTube. Uh, otherwise, the Legend Box has a Q&A thread. Is there a Q- is that, uh, I guess there's cube help in the Discord. Right? Yeah, so so the Discord doesn't have necessarily a Q&A thread, but uh, right. the cube help channel is extremely high traffic. Uh, people are constantly posting questions in there. People are constantly posting answers in there. So if you have any question about cube whatsoever, uh, whether it be super simple, whether it be more complex, like you want people to look over your cube, cube help is an excellent channel in the Discord server for you to ask your questions. You have that, you have the Facebook group with the Q&A, and then you also have any of our any of the comment sections in our videos. So Connor and I check all of those platforms, and if we find interesting questions within those, we will bring those onto the podcast and talk about them on here. So there's always a chance your question might get answered here on the pod. So it's always exciting, right? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, we are, we are always on the lookout for interesting questions. This question that we are answering right now, we actually got off of the legend box thread. So, uh, you could, you could have the next question at the end of the show. For sure. And I think that's going to do it for this episode. Connor, thanks again for your time. Good luck in the champions cube. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully I don't need too much of it, but you know, unpacking a uh, base set Oak and UCLA and computer search and back to back packs would be a really nice way to go about it. So. <laughs> You're right. So fingers crossed for that, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, draft. I'll take luck for that, but uh, hopefully I don't need it too bad. Well, at least I hope you have fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Definitely hope I have fun. Hope I play good games at least. Exactly. We'll hopefully get to see some on stream. I, I sure hope so. <laughs> Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode. Once again, thanks, Connor, for ho- for uh, co-hosting with me. Uh, check out Champions Cube, February 6th at uh, around 12 to 1 p.m. Central. Make sure to check the Cube Discord or the Facebook page for more information on Champions Cube, where you can catch that, all the stream information. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's going to just do it for this episode. Once again, you've been listening to PQ, the one and only Pokemon Cube podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Martin, with Connor Lavelle. And we'll catch you guys next time.